Welcome to week two of the Archon Team League Championships. My name is Frodan, and today I'm joined by Kriparian, as hey well as RDU, as a special player caster. Hi. So we're going to start it off. Uh, Crip, how you doing, man? I'm um, doing pretty good. Uh, I'm excited to see how this tournament will start rolling out. We kind of had uh, all the teams basically being introduced in, uh, in last week's matches. And, uh, you know, they're able to bring different decks, they're able to try different things, so I'm, I'm kind of curious how things will uh, kind of roll out uh, today, because it might, it might be like um, an indicator on how they will uh, roll out for the rest of the season. Sure, sure. And RDU, how have you been enjoying the, the league so far? You played last time and your team was able to squeak out a win, but it was pretty close. Uh, yeah, I really like the league. I think it's uh, the best system to see teams going for the win and helping the, each other. I think the most important thing that a team can do in this league is just don't flame your teammates because it's really hard when you're last to play. And my, my teammates supported me and I got a win in the end. Do, do you yeah, think actually, some I'm people? Really... Oh, I'm curious yeah, yeah, yeah. If, if maybe some players were flamed on other teams. Maybe you heard about any stories. Uh, I'm not sure. Maybe. Okay. I did hear stories, Crip. But we'll, uh, oh, we'll cross man. that bridge when we get there because it's uh, it's fun to talk about it uh, when we actually have the teams in front of us. We don't have to bring it up just yet. Uh, we're gonna have Value Town versus Force and Boys to begin things off. For anybody tuning in for the first time and they're curious about this league, let's go ahead and explain how the league works functionally. So, Crip, why don't you go ahead and talk about how today's matches will proceed? All right. So it's a it's a best of eleven. Um, I mean, you can win as a player, but that doesn't matter as much as your team getting uh, the first six points. Um, so each of the players bring in two decks. Uh, it's a total of six decks per team, and each of the six decks have to be unique classes. So, you know, you have to kind of coordinate with your team which one is playing Grim Patron Warrior and the rest. It's blind pick. You don't know what you're playing against. Um, and yeah, that's that's really mostly it. the The interesting part is that when you get to like a few number of uh, few number of decks, you know the other team can kind of like start counter picking you, and it's kind of hard to put up those last points on the board, which we've experienced mm -hmm. in the tournament so far. Um, and uh, there's there's a lot of like team dynamic that we don't really get to experience, but maybe now with RDU, he can kind of fill us in, kind of how things should be working on the internal side of things. That's right. Speaking of how things will work from that point on, we have, uh, you know, we have some weeks where people will be playing. It's round robin. Each team will be playing each other once. Um, and as you can see on your screen, there's a lot to play for in terms of the cutoff in the standings. Team six and seven will be playing in a redemption phase 1.5, uh, where they face off. The winner of that will go into the official phase two, where they play for two wild card spots for the offline finals. Of course, the top two ranking teams automatically go to phase three which is the live offline finals mm -hmm. and we're, we're doing this because it's a lot of money on the line two hundred and fifty thousand dollars so uh, they're really trying to make sure that all the teams get as much chance as possible you know they always talk about how more games and card games in general uh, decreases the variance so i guess that's the whole point the you really don't have any excuse for being eighth place in the team league if you go zero and eight you, you require to lose a lot of games that way someone has to be eighth yeah, unfortunately. Now, um, let's go ahead and preview this match coming up here, RDU. Value Town versus Force and Boys is two teams that don't necessarily have like a strong actual team in terms of the organization. It's Force and Oskaka and Chucky, um, and then you have Trump, Kibler, and Dog. How do you feel like they did in the first week, um, even though that they did get the win? Were you very impressed with their play at all? I was super impressed. I was especially impressed of how Brian Kibler played. And what uh, decks he brought? He brought uh, Shaman, which was like kind of weird. But in this six deck format, you are forced to bring a class that is weaker than the others. For example, everybody will bring Warrior for sure. Everybody's probably going to bring Warlock. We see that uh, Vedutan decided to not bring Warlock, which is like really exciting. But uh, usually, you have to bring one or two worst cl worst classes than the others, like Paladin, like Priest, Shaman. And uh, this spices things up because when you are left with that, those classes, you have to get the win somehow. Well, that's an interesting point. But like, um, in in your experience, how much worse is that sixth spot compared to like the first few? Kind of five percent every matchup, or like per total, and that five percent can matter. Like, if the warrior has like sixty percent overall, let's say win rate, 
the priest will have kind of like 40, 45 in every matchup. If you get a bit lucky, maybe 50, 50. And that's a spot you don't want to put yourself. That's considering like you play the class perfectly. And perfect play rarely happens in Hearthstone if the game like seeds five or six turns. I feel in a, in a lot of tournaments, uh, it's usually like Priest or Shaman that just gets a bunch of runaway wins. Why do you think that happens and why do you think it won't happen in this one? I think it's usually variance if they get a runaway win. But uh, the best way to look at it is looking at Rogue, which is a class that if they draw Sprint on the exact turn they need it, it's just like one of the best classes. And if they don't draw Sprint or the game, they just insta lose. And you see people just winning all the time with Rogue, and you see people being reversed or swept by playing Rogue. So, um, yeah, that's one example. I think part of it is also the unexpected factor. I think um, people don't necessarily know how to prepare well against Priest because they don't really account for it being strong in the, the Conquest tournament lineup. And so sometimes it surprises people. Just take a look at HTC this past weekend. Priest did really well for Dog and Gara, and they both went really far into the tournament. Gara got to the top four, and then Dog ended up getting to the finals, losing to Trump. Um, and Priest was the highest win rate in the entire tournament. 100%. Only dropped, yeah, well, it, it was until it, it got to... Uh, well, it eventually lost, right? Because you can't... No, it didn't lose. It, it didn't like, lose? Other, no, it, the Priest won, and other decks failed to take a win because it's Conquest. Pr Priest never oh. lost in the entire tournament. Oh, wow. I thought I could have sworn it dropped one game, but it's 100%. Well, so. oh, it's the highest win rate yeah. there, for sure. Um, and I think it was really pleasantly surprising to see Priest be able to do well, considering that um, some of these lists are also differing in terms of how they build it out, right? You see an Acolyte of Pain being put in there for card draw, and um, you see it, how it stabilizes with Valence Chosen. So I like seeing some of the small innovations to the class as well. Mm. Yeah, I think um, we've seen like two types of priests. There's a lot of like uh, small changes to them, but there's generally like the anti-aggro Deathlord priest and like the typical combo control priest. Um, and uh, each of those had one showing in the tournament you mentioned, and I mean, both of them seemed to win 100% of the time, so... I don't know. Seems pretty good. All right, cool. So I think we're ready to get started with our first match. Uh, but before we do, we also have a quick player video to get to know Dog and show you guys what all he's all about. Hey, I'm Dog. I play for Complexity Gaming. As a Hearthstone player, I'm mostly known for... Mm, a little bit of everything. Uh, my playstyle is a little unique in the fact that I like uh, Rogue and more combo-ish decks. Uh, my tournament results aren't really anything to brag about, but they're not terrible either. What I think about the Team Conquest format is it's like kind of interesting because I, uh, I went to China for a month with Tempo Storm actually, and we had something kind of similar. It was uh, everyone had to play each class, right? So it's kind of the same thing since I know overlapping classes. And I really like that, like, it, it gives a lot more diversity to it, and it makes people play classes that they may not be, like, they may not be comfortable with, but also, like, we can assign classes, right? Uh, my favorite deck right now is either Rogue or Mally Lock. Uh, I like Mally Lock a lot, just because, like, it can be aggro, and it also, like, I don't know, if you, if you try to take a control approach against it, you're just gonna get bursted down from 30. Uh, Rogue is just good against ev everything, like, Prep is just a better innervate, right? Because it like takes three mana from it, it doesn't take two, so it's like, yeah. Uh, I would like to play with Trump the most, so he can teach me how to maximize value. And I would like to play against uh, Team Celestial the most. More specifically, Tiddler, because I lost to him in the DreamHack Finals, and I need my revenge. All right, well, Dog uh, certainly looking good nowadays. He's gotten really far into DreamHack, and I mean, actually, that's back-to-back -back finals um, from him and the HTC. So he's really starting to pick up the results, and I think uh, he's looking to come out strong here, not just for himself and on behalf of Team Complexity, but for Team Value Town with him, Kibler, and Trump. People are pegging him as well as the rest of the team as one of their favorite tournament or favorite teams in the tournament. Not to necessarily mm -hmm. win, but just in terms of you know, the personal following, because they, they have a lot of players that they like and enjoy watching. That's right. Uh, Valentine does have a pretty nice roster. Uh, Kibler hasn't had quite the tournament success of Trump and Dog, but so far in the Archon League, uh, he's undefeated. So, um, hey, no complaints there. Uh, the team is looking as uh, strong as ever. 
You know, I'm actually realizing that the captains for these teams uh, have won a tournament each, but I don't think I've really seen Kibler, Dog, Oskaka, and Chalky take down tournaments. They always gotten like second place or like like pretty far in. I guess Kibler won Challenge Stone, but in terms of like the constructed tournaments where you really go for that glory and all the, the mm. prize money, uh, I think these guys are really looking for some good results here coming up soon. Yeah, I feel like Chalky had to have won something like some time ago. He's, he's, he's kind of like dog. He's just he's just placed like really well a lot of the time. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I don't know. There's been so many over the yeah. course of the last year in Hearthstone. So here we have it. We have uh, dog versus Kaka. Dog on Priest again. Uh, I'm betting it's the same deck I saw him play a few days ago, which is the anti aggro Death Lord Priest, um, which seems like it might be pretty poorly against Rogue because a lot of um, uh, a, a lot of the strength of the deck relies in, in buffing minions, and uh, that is not so great when you're facing Sap. Yeah, for sure. Um, I, I think I like to hear RDU's talk about this a little bit because I know he's a big Rogue specialist, and um, yeah, he's actually very fair. Artie, what do you think about Rogue versus Priest nowadays? Has it gotten any better at all for the Priest? I think it has because the Priest has the power to just play threats. When I started playing Priest, like some months ago, I realized that you can actually win versus Rogue if you manage to pressure, pressure, pressure. And if the Rogue doesn't have a way to deal with your pressure, you just win the game. Also, Harrison helps a lot. Mm -hmm. Oh, certainly, certainly. Because part of the reason of what makes it really difficult is that Rogue can outvalue Priest very easily. And Priest doesn't have a lot of inherent card draw in the normal deck, right? If you don't have the Northshire Cleric, how are you normally drawing cards? So if Rogue outvalues you and gets even a big blade flurry, you run out of threats. And like Ardu you said, if you can't keep up that pressure, what do you end up doing? Um, but in this scenario, Harrison Jones really helps that. Thought Steel gets a an okay. Oh no, that's that's like a really good Thought Steel. I feel. Uh, you think so? There's, yeah, there's cards that just suck. Like you can't you like. You can't use so many of the cards. You can't use Blade Flurry. You can't use Deadly Poison. You can hardly use the Tinker Oil. Um, Sprint is often like uh, too big of a tempo loss to play. Uh, there's just so many cards in the Rogue deck that just fail to get any value with the Thought Steal. And that's another problem. Like you mentioned, it's hard to to keep up card draw, to keep up everything, and uh, it, it's it's you know impacted even more when Priest often relies on Thought Steal to get that edge against other classes. Consider. Fair enough. Um, it's just that the Pilot Shredder is good for the continual pressure. And actually, I really like Sap too, now I think about it, because uh, if you can continue to apply that pressure, it might not matter what they're putting out onto the board um, to try and stall you. Mm -hmm. Sapping a Shredder is like a huge tempo. So if the Rogue somehow draws into Shredder and the Priest manages to sap that and play something himself, he might be favored to win this versus Soskaka. All right. Well, there's there's quite a bit to think about here. Uh, he has uh, he has a very high value hand, but it's a lot of the same. Like Lothab doesn't really accomplish anything here. You got two Azure Drakes, so you're kind of like thinking about putting one out this turn because it's hard to play two at any other time. You could also backstep Tinker. Hmm. Actually, is I like a, the backstab tinker, yeah. Can, is this a hand that you can afford to go aggressive? I guess you can. You already have uh, a flurry, and you have ways to refill the hand, too, with sprint and two Azure Drakes. I wonder if Lotep was better than the Azure Drake. Because if you go for backstab and trade with Asai, you could play Lotep to stop him from playing any spells and guarantee the 5 damage and then follow up with Azure Drake. But at the same time, if you play Azure Drake, you can follow up with Lotep and be in the same spot. Mm -hmm. Lothab may have turned out a little bit better as he's facing a 4-5 Shredder here. Lothab was better because on turn 6 usually Priest has a play, but on turn 5 they usually do spells. That's what I was thinking. Hmm. But Toskaka is a Rogue Specialist, he likes to play Rogue a lot, and from what we heard from Blizzard, he's the player with the biggest win rate. So he well, knows, if it was he for one season, I think. It, it's not like he's the best overall win rate, I'm sure there's you know some people who have 
absurd win rate, but don't play very much. Um, but I think Auskaka had the single highest win rate in any individual season on ladder, which is like really impressive because I think it was like almost 70% or something. So either way, it's, he's played a lot of games with Rogue, like you mentioned. Um, so I usually trust his judgment because he's definitely like thinking about a lot of the possibilities, kind of like life coach in a way. Um, he doesn't just make a play because he felt like it was good. He thought through a lot of the, the options. What do you think of Live Bomb here? Just deal with the both drakes. Looks pretty good. Yeah, how else do you deal with these drakes? I guess the only other alternative is to either load up the board or to sap one and trade the other. Um, don't, mm. Yeah, but if you sap, you, you don't have much of a play besides Death Lord. Right. That, that doesn't feel very good. Cable is kind of useless. You can only use Tontalnos or on something he gets from Shredder. Sivonas is also pretty bad in this matchup. Harrison, on the other hand, is nice. Well, um, I believe this deck does run the Shrinkmeister. So with the Shrinkmeister, you get a lot more options from those cards. I have no time for games. Yeah, you're right. You can still Drake even. Sivonas. That's actually a really good play because if he wants to kill the Sivonas using the Drake and the Dagger, he cannot kill the Shredder. But uh, this way he can kill it with the Fan of Knives, which is a card that uh, rogues usually run too off. Yeah, but if you do the Fan of Knives, um, do you have much flexibility? Yeah, you can play a free drop, or you can yeah, prep Fan of Knives. Well, we have to consider the, the options from the Shredder then, right? If we do the Fan of Knives first. Hmm. Oh yeah, I guess you could Fan first to see... Um, yeah, but what if it's like a Noyatron? Can we deal with like all the options? Uh, so you can, but you just have to part ways with another card like Blade Flurry. That's really annoying. You probably have to attack first because the chance of him getting a Taunt is bigger than the chance of him getting a Doomsayer. Hmm. And him getting a Doomsayer is like the only bad scenario. Oh my goodness. He's just going for face. He calculated a possible turn to lethal. Two turn lethal, sorry. Okay, if he adds oh, another I, I, oil next turn, that's uh, 9 damage plus the, um, well that's it, the Adjudic's not going to survive. That's a pretty good Harrison. I did hear that face is the place, so... Oh! Alright, well, he was finally rewarded for Pilot Shredder being in the middle, by the way. Yeah? Already, when you play, you One have extra to. damage. <laughs> I don't think it really mattered, because it would buff Harrison no matter what. And if, Surva if Sivana survives next turn, you still win. In this situation, it didn't matter that much. But yeah, he got rewarded. So many yeah. Options. I always play that pilot shirt in the middle. You get the doggy and the flame tongue totem. Yeah, it's a good technical play for sure. You also, you also get a smaller creature just in case uh, Betrayal ever gets teched in. You know? That's right. You're absolutely correct. I'm not sure if I ever saw Britair being played on Constructed. It's not it was back in the early. Yeah. It's not, it's not that bad in Arena either. So, it's, you, it, if you play other game modes, you might see it once in a while, but I, I can understand it. I don't really feel like Betrayal is very common at all in any race. This, this should be game over. You just load up Devlord and go full face, right? Uh, yeah, there's no way to actually deal with this board. Lothab draw here was really big, and uh, there's just no way to take care of the board, and his big uh, weapon was taken care of. So sometimes in your Lothab, Rogue can still Blade Flurry for you know, seven mana and take care of the board, but in this case, Oskok has nothing, and the Priest is destroying the Rogue right now. Well, Rogue yeah. drawing double oil, double sprint, no preparation, sap only now. Kind of poor draws from Oskaka's side. But this is what happens when you play Rogue. This is the kind of things that can happen. Yeah, it's true. One of the criticisms against bringing Rogue is that you often beat yourself because the way the draws end up panning out and you just don't have enough uh, resources or you just have awkward draws all throughout the game. Um, so I guess that was a really good case study of the Rogue not having what they need and the Priest was able to pressure with a really good curve. That's kind of a theme for uh, most decks that are somewhat combo oriented. Rogue isn't exactly like a, a one combo type of deck. Uh, it's just a lot of cards that have synergized a lot of other cards. And those type of decks just struggle with that in general. So yeah, absolutely. 
But look at that. Priest continues undefeated. Look at that. Oh, man. Undefeated for the week, right? Is, is that what we're going for with? dog. Yeah. Oh, for dog. For the week. Okay. For the week, too. Sure. No, it's, uh, I mean, it's, it's out of the way. It's interesting that some of these guys that are bringing the different unique classes, too, are throwing out their unusual classes first. If you can recall last week, Value Town threw out the Mech Shaman first to just start things off, and other people were throwing Paladin to begin things, even though you know you have Actually, Warrior and uh, Warlock and Hunter, all classes that are like really strong overall against the field. I think it was RDU that threw out Paladin first for his team. What, what was that like? Is there uh, some kind of strategy that you'd like to talk to us about? Uh, personally, I don't think pick order matters in Conquest. It's like statistical not worth to just go with the weakest class or anything other strategy you can think of. I mm -hmm. think you just like roll a die or pick yourself randomly. That's like the okay. best way to go. Because you are, you become unpredictable. If you think you're better than your opponent, you don't want to give him the edge of out mind gaming you in the picking side. It's just, if you pick randomly, you cannot get mind gamed. And if you think you are better skill wise, why not just pick randomly all the time? Because in Conquest it doesn't matter since you have to win with every deck. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, uh, certainly good to see the priest pick up a win. Um, and we also we, we talked about we touched a little bit on how these players have to bring uh, a few suboptimal classes. So Trump has Paladin, um, and the team has I guess more than one uh, of these classes that we would maybe consider suboptimal because they fail to bring Warlock. Now, yeah. um, what what do you think about the the paladin class? We saw you play like uh, the the aggressive all in divine favor paladin. Um, is is there any other type of paladin that you can play right now? Mm, you can play mid ranger control, but I don't think it's as good as aggro paladin. Aggro mm. paladin just has the option to beat everything. You can get a really good insane divine shield start with uh, a lot of buffs to follow up. Unfortunately, I only got that kind of hand in the last game. I wish I had something close to that in the first game versus Firebad, as Chucky did. I know Chucky also used uh, the Agro Paladin. I think it's the best type of Paladin you can play, and uh, a really fine-tuned list can be really good. We saw last month that Agro Paladin reached number one legend on both servers a couple times. When I actually, it even did that in China, so on all the servers. I think Agro Paladin is something insane. And uh, we might see Chucky bringing Agro Paladin again versus Trump's possibly mid range Paladin. I know that Trump doesn't like Agro that much. When I started talking about Paladin, I didn't realize we were about to see a Paladin versus Paladin game. Oh boy. Um, it seems like uh, if both players are playing the aggressive Paladin, that this is, this, this is the type of game that ends up winding down immediately as neither player's Divine Favor is going to get much value. Yeah, I, I, although I think Trump would be playing more the mid range, or at least the slower paladin. I don't know if you can consider it mid range or control, because I've seen it play a lot on stream. And Trump seems to be more of a man of science when it comes to Hearthstone. Like he plays a lot of the deck. Um, I'd be very surprised if Trump just whipped out a deck that he hasn't shown many people. I feel that in this matchup, Agro Paladin is heavily favor favored. Yeah. Um, the, in the Paladin mirrors in general that I've experienced, the faster deck kind of wins by a lot. And this aggro Paladin that Chalky will probably be playing is a lot faster than the typical mid-range Paladin. Zombie Chow is going to be pretty good. Yeah. So Chucky needs a really good start to be able to overcome that. At the same time, if Trump gets his towns out, he will stand a chance. Usually, the only towns that the midrange paladin have is like a Belcher and maybe an Argus, and Belcher usually gets silenced. So if you get a really good quality Argus, you can stop the Agro Paladin. Mm -hmm. It's true, and then also paladin midrange paladin is able cap is capable of curving out just as well as some of the aggressive ones with you know mini bots, muster for battle, and you just you have a big board too fighting back immediately. Um, and that's part of what Paladin is really good at, seizing that tempo if it curves out well. Although we don't really know... Okay, I was about to say, we don't really know Chalky's hand at the moment. Um, that's, that's kind of awkward. What do you think is the best way to play this? You could go for the abusive and then coin master, and you deal with the zombie chow. But then if your opponent has a 2-drop, it becomes kind of bad. So now Chalky probably calculates the chance of Trump having a 2-drop to follow the zombie chow. 
I think just playing the uh, shield and mini bot counters a lot of two drops. Um, so I kind of like the shield and mini bot. Yeah, uh, mini bot allows you to answer pretty much whatever comes out, but then your follow up, like already you said, is even is a lot weaker too, because then you only have knife juggle the following turn and abusive plus a one drop. So I like that this keeps more options available because the muster for battle can come out and control the board, or he can even take it based off his next draw and play it according to his curve. If Trump would draw Master for Bell, he would put himself in like an almost unlosable spot unless Chucky gets Consecration. But uh, at this point, Chucky, I don't think he can play around Master for Bell. I think he just yellows Minibot and hopes for the best. Mm -hmm. You might want to keep the coin to go turn 4 Knife Juggler coin Master for Bell as Chucky, but he might not be able to be that defensive. He might have to coin Master. Yeah, you have to coin Master here. So now he decides to, to not play around Master, which is like a really good uh, play by Chucky. He need, he, you need to know when to go aggressive and not to care about your opponent's cards. Put this apple on your head. Double knife juggler is kind of threatening. I think you have to hit the face. Trading there is like pretty bad because your opponent has to trade for you anyways. Yeah, there's really nothing that uh, you can be surprised based off of t a three mana, right? He already used Abusive Sergeant as well. So he can't take out both Knife Jugglers, at least at the moment, from what you've seen. Yeah, it's just that this deck has like a lot of buffs. Um, like even Abusive, that kind of stuff. It's just, uh, if you can't kill both the guys, then you might as, might as well not kill either of them. I think that's most of the situation. Mm -hmm. Let me think. What do you think of playing Minibot, trading one dude and the, and the face into one juggler, ignoring yeah. the other juggler, and then uh, hoping that the Minibot keeps the Divine Shield next turn, so that you either trade or just uh, Blessing of Kings? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Blessing of Kings has just gotten so much better um, with Divine Shield, so I, I definitely like playing Minibot first, so that way you keep your options open. Oh, wow, look at face that. juggle. That is a really, really bad juggle. Yeah. Hmm. It's unfortunate because even if he hit like the one one, at least he'd be able to keep his knife jugger reasonable health. But this is uh, this can be pretty brutal. Actually, this can be pretty brutal for Chalky here because um, yeah. it seems like the knife juggler play is better than the um, than the play with kings, and because of that, he's going to open himself to concentrate a little bit though. But he gets the juggle that Trump was looking for. Yeah, and uh, instead he's a bit resilient to consecrate. Doesn't run against the Belcher. Jackie plays around consecration really well, but by not going double juggler, that's really smart. Okay, well, um, here I think it's pretty easy. Kings play. Uh, it's yeah, just trade when, it. when do you want to drop that Argent Squire to go for the uh, juggle? Do you want to do it on the slime? Uh, sure, why not? If it misses, you can still trade uh, the dude. Let's see, 50-50. You want to get rid of the square as soon as possible so that you get divine, divine favor value. Mm -hmm. And you do not really care about the 1-1 one, one since you don't run Carter Master. You just want the maximum damage output. And Trump is in a, in a pretty grim spot right now. Yeah, one of the issues that the uh, the mid-range Paladin has is that um, it's it's very hard to actually play something relevant while answering one of your opponent's threats. Um, it's kind of why the deck is labeled for slow. So That's one of the reasons mm. why I don't know you, why would you play it over Warlock. Like, a Handlock or a Zoo is so much better versus most of the decks out there. Mm -hmm. While, as you said, Midrange Pali is pretty slow. So he gets like a really good Peacekeeper, but it doesn't actually matter because he continues to lose. Yeah. If he gets an Owl, it will become a 2-2, two -two, right, if he tries to silence his own mini bot. Right. But that's not an option. Um, an Owl would be okay, because you'd get a pretty decent Consecrate. Mm. Yeah, but uh, even if he gets the Consecration off, I think the board's built up enough that uh, if he can't clear it, just more pressure will be coming every single turn. 
Mm. And this is a kind of another aspect that people don't really um, keep in mind because usually a lot of these um, a lot of these games have to do with like combos and are very one sided. But in these marginal situations, if you're behind against like a high number of creatures and your board clear is not effective, you often have to make suboptimal plays that just result in you playing more things. So Sylvanas seemed like a much better play there, but Sylvanas will trade into the uh, small creature board of Chalky over too many turns for it to be relevant. Mm -hmm. Sure, sure. This How much is damage is divine... this, by the way? Oh, is this Divine Favor? Because I just think we can calculate damage as well. Uh, um, you want to play the Divine Favor now because you want to play through Silver next turn and you will not have mana to Divine Favor. And there's a big chance you draw a 1-drop because this deck runs a lot of 1-drops. I know that also Chucky runs uh, Deck Hand and Worgen in his deck. And now he can go really aggressive. He gets double juggler hits. That's a really good turn. But the question is, do you trade or do you just uh, go for face? face? Face is the place, man. You let your opponent have Whoa. better trades himself if you go for face. But, uh... Mm. Yeah, well, I think, um... I think that's unfortunately it, right? Because Trump has to use Consecration here, but he doesn't have enough to use Heal Bot or Taunt anything. Yeah. Exactly the problem the, the deck runs into here. Just one mana short from being able to accomplish everything he wants. On every turn, yeah. Wasn't Tyrion better than just instantly losing to the board? Oh, you don't lose those, never mind. Yeah, the Arden Squire is the only thing that remains. But it's so easy for that deck to pair any damage, whether it's just a weapon, yeah. another Consecrate themselves, if they run the Avenging Wrath, if they have a Charger, a buff. Yeah, not not much Trump could really do. Uh, we do we do even see the uh, the proof of the uh, the plays working out a bit there, with uh, like Sylvanas kind of, you know, being less flexible at least. So even though Trump had some fairly difficult plays to make, I think he made them all just fine. It's just uh, the way the deck plays is not really quick enough right, in this matchup. Yeah. All right. Well, I mean. I guess on the plus side, we get to see if Paladin can actually match up against the field uh, a little bit better because that was you know, pretty much a stomp from, from one side. The, the fact that the aggressive Paladin has a pretty big edge over them. Uh, but taking a look at the, the rest of the classes, we do have you know Warlock, Mage, Hunter. How do you feel like Paladin stacks up against those classes? Because we know how Paladin does against the regular classes of like Rogue or Patient Warrior, do you? I think it's good versus Warlock. It should be good versus Hunter. It's really bad versus Freeze Mage. It can win versus Rogue, probably even more than Priest does, and we see Priest already won. And versus Patron, you can outcard them if they don't get good battle rages and good early game value. And also Quartermaster is really insane in that matchup. So Paladin is decent, I guess, but uh, it's probably the weakest deck that Value Town has right now. Okay. Okay, well, uh, we'll see if that ends up being the case. Remember, if Trump loses again, or say, say Value Town sends out Trump, we do have something called the bench rule. Are you? Uh, you've, you, did you get benched last time? Last week? Uh, no, I didn't. I think okay. Colento got benched. He's Colento the only player the that, that got benched. I think he's That's the only right. player that got benched. Oh, actually, um, one other person got benched too. I can't remember off the top of my head. Oh, but, on the second uh, day, perhaps? Yeah, on the second day. Um, it was just like unfortunate that it just kept happening there. But if you lose two in a row, right? uh, you can't play until another player on your team wins. This is to avoid having one player just queue up, you know, five games in a row and try to, you know, try to just grab a win. And this way, we all can we see some diversity across the team. Like you'll see every player at play at least once. Yeah. yeah, it's pretty demoralizing losing for the team. It's like one thing losing for yourself because you can afford it sometimes. Mm -hmm. Like, you cannot change it, it's a card game, you still win and lose, but when you lose for the team, you feel something different, you like, you wish you win, it's so bad going to your teammates and telling them that you lost, and that they have to carry you and win for you. <laughs> well, I they can't you, you carry you all the way, you still, yeah, have, you to still have to win, yeah, they have but, to carry you morally, it's like, you, you can do it, man, you got this, it was just some bad RNG, you know? Yeah, that's the part where they shouldn't flame you. And uh, for me, it was really good. They supported me and I managed to get my win. For other teams, I don't know. Frodan said he has some stories. 
No, I'm just saying that I've, I've heard some stories. I'm not sure if they're true or not, just rumors. Just rumors. Well, we're, we're going to we're gonna have to hear what you heard when when, yeah, when later, it's the right time. Yeah. Later on, later on. Later you'll, on. Have to, you'll have to watch then, RDU. You know, who is, is, it, is it Tice that's the most supportive of you? Because every time I see you and Tice at tournaments, it's always like you guys are coaching each other and trying to keep the mindset clear. Uh, all the team, Life Coach Tice and also Lothar, were really supportive. Nice. Good. Oh man, that force okay. knowledge. Well, with this, I believe we're going to see all six players in the first three games. Pretty much what the people came to see. How did uh, I suppose... Forsen perform? Oh, sorry. Uh, Forsen, I think he's going to play Freeze Mage, and Brian Kibler, if he's keeping the Hunter from last week, he will be like heavily favored versus Freeze Mage. Mm hmm. Uh, Forsen last week, to answer your question, Crip, is he went 2-0. He played his games very quickly. I believe it was Forsen Boys against Temple Storm, and Forsen Boys was up 5-0. Yeah. Where Oskaka, Forsen, and, um, and Chaki were able to grab their wins very quickly. And then Oskaka had to just win with Druid, and then Temple Storm almost reverse swept it. It was pretty cool. But um, mm -hmm. uh, Forsen... Also got a very bad matchup on paper. He had Freeze Mage versus Druid, and he was able to take that win. So it wasn't like, you know, Force and Boys had it easy uh, in terms of the road there. Force had to overcome a pretty big obstacle. And if if RDU's prediction is correct, and you know, Kibler is playing a similar Hunter last week, and he Hello. is favored once again. Force and Freeze Mage is not in a very favorable position uh, in this matchup. Right. Uh, now, uh, Kibler was in a very similar situation. He just, like, uh, I think he played the first and third game and won both of them immediately in a pretty, pretty short amount of time. Yeah. Uh, so bo both these players are actually so far undefeated in the Archon team tournament. That's true. Did we see, did we see Kibler keeping Loteb in his starting hand? I missed that. I think that if he keeps Loteb, is like, pretty bad for Forsen because he became predictable. Like, if Forsen would have brought the aggr an aggressive mage, a tempo mage or flame waker mage, he would just, like, insta-win versus Kibler just because Kibler kept low tab. But Kibler was sure Forsen is, like, 100% going to play freeze mage if he decided to keep the low tab. Yeah, I think this is something that everyone's pegged on the Forsen boys because all three players on that team love freeze mage you see chalky bringing it to tournaments very often even though he's known as an aggressive player oskaka's brought freeze mage a ton that's how he also got far in some tournaments and forsen i mean he's played freeze mage more than almost anybody uh in competitive tournaments in terms of from what my memory serves so i think uh that's certainly something that's a really good point rdu you. you don't want to become too predictable because then but then you start skewing the percentages a little bit in your favor because you can start cornering decks and lineups a little bit more now, what do you think about the silence on the Mad Scientist? Um, it seemed like the, the most damage play that you could make was the, the second juggler and then the abusive. Um, do, you, do you think it's better to kind of control the, the, the draw, essentially, by denying the secret? I think that uh, he should have probably went for the juggler. You get more juggles out, and it's a bigger chance to kill Scientist, therefore protecting your juggler. And I think juggler is more important than stopping your opponent from getting a secret now. You can still use the owl later on on either unfreezing uh, one of your minions or just denying another secret. So yeah, your your suggested play is probably better, Creep. Okay. Well, Kibler's still in a really good spot here. Just uh, charge into the face and hero power the face every turn. Uh, and it looks like clear sailing. Yeah. Well, I mean, there's still like ice barrier and ways to stall. Um, and the thing about decks that have a lot of chargers and hunters that you have to activate them um, eventually because that's your main source of damage. So if there's ways for uh, Forsen to eventually grab ways to stall the board and pick up some of his key cards um, to flip the matchup like Alex Straza's or um, anything that can help him stabilize and there's still a chance for Forsen to, to pull this out here. Look at that, back at 19. Everything's easy peasy. Gain, he just basically gained a couple of turns back into this game. And he also has Antonitis. No, uh, maybe he, that can help convert too. I think he gained less than one turn. I think Kibler does more than eight damage this turn. Yeah, he's doing Kibler nine this turn. <laughs> yeah, he has to go for the Wolf Rider. Yeah. You want to hero power every turn. As you said, Creep. 
is really important in this matchup. Also, you know, the one health minions are a bit weak against uh, the slower mage decks, which obviously Freeze Mage is. So to punish them, you want to play as many one health minions at the same time as possible so they get attacks in. And with one one health minion on the board right now, um, it may work out. Okay, because of the loath up here. So what loath up? Oh, loath up before uh, turn eight is usually like a really powerful play if you can guarantee loath up hits and you can pop, or you can threaten lethal damage whether they have ice block up or not. I remember last week um, when we were reviewing some games, Gara was just like you know lecturing other teammates about like how to how to play certain things, and he says loath up. Um, you know, or before turn eight is probably the key, unless you're trying to block like a post Alex Straza lethal on yourself if you're trying to go for a kill. Hmm. I would have liked the Wolf Rider more. Turn six is not such a key turn. I would much rather play Lotep on turn seven for the Freeze Mage. You can push more damage that way. Well, how much does he have now? He's got. Uh... 7, uh, 14. 12, 14 max out of 17. Yeah. That's pretty close. That's that's not bad considering that Hunter Creeper will also stick onto the board. It's actually yeah. 16 because the Lepernum dies. Oh, you're right, you're right, you're right. Um, it's one off. Wow, that's really close. <laughs> he just goes for it. Wow. Sure. That's pretty risky, I would say. I like it. I mean, I think there's you really can't go wrong either way. Um, I like that Kilber went for a charger now in case he has a second ice barrier, so this Wolf Rider won't give him a second chance to have another secret being out. And in this case, look, the ice barrier was drawn. Um, and this, and then now he can use Kill Command just as simply a way to get him down to one with the hero power and then threaten him two turns in a row. Also, in this position, if you're forced and you you know you're you're going to die next turn to something. Um, it's just like you have to manage risk a little bit. So if you feel you're kind of screwed anyway, I think you'd actually play the ice barrier this turn. Mm -hmm. Okay, fair enough. I think he really wants to search for his Alex Straza, or if he's running a heal bot, like he needs to get some sort of draw out here. But the problem also exists where he he can't necessarily part ways with the coin comfortably because his coin is his key to play Alex Straza next turn. Uh, but he can't do that and develop Ice Block at the same time, so he's got to make some choices here. He pings the Acolyte. I would have liked just Acolyte and then Ice Block because you can just draw Alex Straza off the top and coin Alex Straza. Now you have to coin into Ice Block. And yep. if he has a way to proc your Ice Block, the only way that you win is getting the second Ice Block and then Alex Straza, which is like... A much uh, lower chance of than just getting Alex Straza. Mm -hmm. I don't know if there's anything that uh, Hunter really constitutes as like a draw they want, other than insurance against Alex Straza. So Quick Shot is nice because it's more damage that can help him refill the hand and get burn back, just in case his opponent bounces back health. But you know your opponent also just used the coin, so Alex Straza is out of the out of the case here. And uh, very important to not play the Haunted Creeper there. If you do, you just kind of give him more options to force him. Yep. Also very true. If Forsen wants a card, he has to invest that two mana. And right <clears> now, <throat> uh, you want, you want mm -hmm. the mage to be restricted on every single, uh, every single point in the game. I mean, maybe even Arcane into that because there's only one more mana for an extra card. And you still want that heal bot if possible. It's, if he even has it. I mean, I don't even know what's... In his deck, um, with 30 We've cards and 30 that. cards. We've seen the, the heal bot, I think, uh, in recent times. Mm -hmm. Forsen is a player who is using that. I don't think he has a heal bot, because if he had it, he had to arcane intellect before pinging. Because he drew two right. cards and not one. And now, he lost. Well, I mean, he always might feel like... Uh, oh, He's just drawing more cards to see what his deck provides then. That's usually a bad idea. Because <laughs> if, if the next card would be Alex or Ice Block, he would just deal himself more. Fair enough, fair enough. Kipler remains undefeated in the Archon Team League so far, coming at 3 0. Three and taking a win with Hunter versus Freeze Mage. And you could say it's fortuitous matchup, but um, I actually really like the way he played that from his mulligans to keeping Lothab and putting Force on Freeze Mage. 
to I mean I know, I know you said that you really like that play for going for the the creeper instead of the the wolf rider, but I think um I, I really like the lines that Kilbert took. It, it made a lot of sense given the the context mm-hmm. of the hands of the matchup. Yeah, certainly the decisive play was to keep Lothab, and it really helps uh, you know further that pressure that you, you really need as the hunter in that matchup. And uh, yeah, he made it work, got the win, good enough, and uh, Forsen is no longer undefeated. That's right. Uh, Forsen has his first loss, but I think he he's going to be okay. Forsen's actually gotten pretty good at handling his emotions. I think uh, when I first saw him in Fight Night, you were there too. Yeah, um, Crip. It's like he, he was definitely more of like you know a pretty emotional player sometimes with his reactions and stuff. But uh, he seems yeah. to be pretty calm nowadays. Yeah, he felt really crushed at some of the moments, especially because back then, um, you know, a lot of players uh, still had room to innovate in new decks for big tournaments, and he was one of those players that really pushed that. Now yeah. we, we don't really see that these days anymore. Uh, the most exciting thing that we really see are uh, tournaments with interesting rules, basically like this one. Um, but, you know, when you take a risk like that, when you're like, hey, guys, trust me, this deck works, and then you lose with it constantly. Yeah. Uh, that's That's got to hit pretty hard. Well, uh, if I, what Crip's talking about is back in the day, Forsen played the weirdest gimmick decks in the world um, ever. It was like Druid would have Ysera and Faceless, uh, so it was like a super greedy ramp deck, but it also had Molten Giants and, like, Mark of the Wilds. So he'd play like two Moltens, or he'd play like one Molten, Faceless one of them when they have a Mark of the Wild, and like play Ysera or something, like all for like 11 mana with Innervate. It was really weird and stupid, but it actually won a game in the game, which was uh, hilarious. Oh, one of the other decks that I remember uh, specifically was a, uh, it was similar to that. It was the Faceless Ancestral Spirit Earth Elemental Shaman that ran uh, Sunwalkers and yeah. two Farsights. Yeah, so if you far sight. sight into like one of the combo pieces, you could do um, Earth Elemental, uh, Ancestral Spirit, and Faceless all in the same turn, mm-hmm. and basically lock out the game. Because back then, um, well, it was a different game. Oh yeah, man! Zoo and uh, Face Hunter was really starting to get popular and whatnot. Um, so he just wanted to go super taunts <clears throat> um, to try to lock out any of that uh, from happening. Uh, now we're going over to Kibler versus Forsen again. Oh, you know, this is... Oh, it is. It's Freeze Mage versus Druid. I thought maybe we just queued up the same screen. So once more. Oh, Ram Druid. I think Freeze Mage is actually favored versus Ram Druid. Forsen also played this matchup quite a lot, from what I know. So he will be favored to win this. Right. I guess the question becomes a few things of, like, if Kibler is running... Like two savage roars in this deck because I know some ramps cut one of them. Um, I, I actually really don't like list. I cut the combo altogether because I think uh, it's too greedy and assuming that you can get away with it. But uh, if he's only running one savage roar, it becomes even more difficult. Like you said, RDU. Do you think we will see an Angriff this game? An Angriff ang- tree. Ang- uh, Angriff is, is is the German ten five cast of Ancient of War. Oh, the uprooted ancient. <laughs> gotcha. I had no idea, man. You're so multilingual, Crip. You speak. Uh, you speak I, I learned English, that from Trump's Romanian. Stream, you speak dank memes, and now you speak German. Yeah. yeah. Dank memes must be the best language ever. <laughs> yeah, he could go for it right now at 10 5. <laughs> uh, and it would be answered by a frost bowl, consequently, but um, it'd, be, it'd be hilarious. Yeah, I mean, if there was no Frostbolt, it would get 10 damage in. Yeah. I'm actually surprised he didn't go for it. I mean, you have no hand with that, basically. It can get Fireballed, or like Frostbolt ping. Well, it couldn't get Fireballed on 3, you'd get 10 damage in, and that would be worth it. You drain a Fireball, you do 10 damage, and you waste mm-hmm. turn 4 on the Mage to slow down the draw. <laughs> um, <laughs> Well, there, there is something to consider, too. Um, Druid's hero power is pretty relevant in this matchup, and we, we do emphasize it a lot, but it only matters if you can continue the pressure. So if you put up the hero power a lot and you gain some armor, so that way when they put Alex Straza onto you, you still have 18, 19, maybe even more health. Um, mm-hmm. That's only relevant if you can keep pressuring to pop the ice block and remove the board. And Ram Druid, is, we, we all know, is slower because you're trying to play big threats one at a time. 
So as much as it might be important for Druid generally to keep up that armor gain, it's only relevant as much as you can to potentially kill the Freeze Mage. I'm surprised he's uh, bringing out the Ancient Award this turn. It just felt like last turn uh, it would have worked out a little bit better. He would have also had the follow-up play with the Big Game Hunter. Uh, I think it was because he wants to... He probably, he probably has a lot of five drops in his deck. Um, and so he's leveraging the coin on whatever he draws next. Mm -hmm. So that way he can coin it out or he can just play something for four. Forsan can now abuse his Acolytes. That's a really good play, attacking, because you play around the uh, Keeper of the Grove. Mm -hmm. And then you can go like Acolyte ping and guarantee yourself at least one draw. And if he has Keeper, he uses Keeper on Acolyte and then he'll probably not Keeper the Emperor. Emperor is going to get like huge value. Yeah, yeah, well, what about this Ancient of Lore smacking for five damage a turn, though? He can remove it over the course of a Frostbolt Fireball, but that is a investment on the hand plus whatever he develops the following turns you're still going to be taking damage from he's not such a big threat right well apparently it's threatening mm -hmm. enough threatening enough to use one ice lens but not uh, the frost bolt whoa oh, that's a draw nice draw well a five drop would have been really good too and yeah i think like half of it was good draws but sure was one of the better ones I think uh, Pilot Shredder is even slightly better than a 5-drop because it does around the same damage on average. Like, it's the same damage as a Druid of the Claw, but it's more resilient, which is the the key thing to some of these decks. Ooh, do um, you mill here? You, you can mill the mage. You can Wrath for can one. You? Yeah, Wrath for one, Hero Power, uh, and then... Because you're not really playing anything significant anyway. Is that worth okay. it? We'll it see. is if it burns out Shraza. If it burns anything else... I think maybe, maybe Thalnos. No, Thalnos well, is a pretty big burn too. Okay. I think that it's worth milling your opponent only if you know the game oh. is going to go to fatigue. Oh, one card off! Yeah. Elastraza oh, sandwiched okay. by two blizzards and it clips the second one. <laughs> no, you're you're absolutely right. It's it's just a very flashy thing to do. Like you know, you get to mill your opponent, but you go on the very small chance that you burn something significant, and that acolyte's gonna draw a second card anyways. So I, I agree with what Crip was saying. I think Kibler wants to develop his hand a little bit better, like draw a card and mill. So I think it served multiple purposes. It wasn't like, well, I can mill and I'm going to make that my primary game plan. I would say it was not really worth it. I'm not sure if this matchup goes to fatigue. And uh, this way you guarantee Forsen the draws that he wanted. Mm -hmm. And uh, at the same time... If you don't meet Alex, you're pretty much losing because you give the Freeze Mage a potential full hand for Emperor. Yeah. Now here I think we're going to see a Wrath for one into Swipe. Swipe's a nice card. I mean, it, it lets you be flexible with damage from hand, which is really the strength of Druid. But I don't see a better answer for it. Uh, you know, actually I realized that uh, Kibler, I think, was one damage oh, off no from... Potentially killing his opponent, right? Because he had swipe and savage. Well, he's two savage wars now. Oh, but he That's can't afford it. Yeah. So his third. opponent needs to have ice block soon. You can just freeze ice barrier. Oh, that's right. Blizzard's now. And then he can. Man. Would you just yolo Alex Fraza next turn, being forced? You have enough to lethal him if he doesn't kill you through the ice barrier. I feel like it really depends on what the board looks like after next turn. Um, if he plays, you know, Shade and another Pilot Shredder, I think that's really scary to just drop Alex Draws on because you have 18 health and there would be, you know, 16 damage on board. I think that's too risky. But Keep I mean, we... to... sorry, continue. Well no, 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 I was, I was saying, but that's not the case here. Kid was going to develop one minion here. I think Zombie Chow is off limits for sure, right? You also know yeah. that, like, n nine mana is available. That's kind of a big deal. Because you, oh. you know he hasn't coined yet. Well, that's an excellent point. Um, I mean, I don't think he even necessarily needs the uh, the full combination. One Savage War is still an insane amount of damage here. It's 21 just with uh, one Savage War. I would, say, I would say it was a really key thing that uh, Kibler punched 
his face to test for secrets because now he, Forsen uh, cannot bluff the ice block and he has to deal with the board in some way or another. Hmm. Well, he can actually put a second ice barrier up now and gain even more health, bounce up to 25. That's not enough. Well, yeah. what if you ice, ice barrier flame strike? That may be enough. Well, it depends on what comes out of Shredder, right? Because you're still not dead to a combination of Force of Nature Saratora yeah. unless something of significant power comes out of that Shredder. Yeah, we could see like uh, a whirling zapomatic tragedy here. <laughs> oh, it's the sickest thing ever when whirling zapomatic gets <laughs> seven damage off two savage wars and it just goes insane. Yeah. yeah. Um, let's see. Five, six. Okay, not enough. Man, that mana worm though, or mana wraith. Excuse me, that mana worm. This way he's not playing around combo, but uh, he had no way to play around combo, so he chose the line of play that gives him the draw next turn, so he goes closer to his ice block. He basically needs ice block into playing Alexstrasza, and then just bursting uh, Kibler down, but Kibler maintains the pressure up, so this is going to be really hard for Forsen. Hmm, let's see, if you have, um, there's no secret up, right? No, there's no secret up. No. So, would you be willing to use Drew the Claw Savage Lord now? And that because you already have another Drew the Claw Savage Lord the following turn, anyways. And that is twelve damage, and you put him down to five. Is that too risky, considering that Thanos is on the board already? Thanos is a pretty good card, but I'm not sure if he's that great. I think we'll probably see Drew the Claw in response, actually. Mm. Okay. Isn't charge better than Thunding usually versus Freeze Mage in this spot? Usually it is, but um, you know, of course you're not playing around Flame Strike. So mm -hmm. the inner arena specialist in Crip is cringing right now. It's gonna die to Flame Strike now. <laughs> what what is this? Of, what do you think of Flame Strike and then Arcane Intellect? Like Arcane Intellect and then Flame Strike? Because you know he doesn't That's have combo. So greedy though. If he had combo, he would have one last turn. So you know he doesn't have combo. And Forson has this kind of thinking. Like, mm -hmm. if he didn't use it, he doesn't have it. Yeah. Oh, he goes man. for the. He goes for the really good play. I like this a lot. You can actually, um, instead of just Flame Strike, you can just Doomsayer Freeze here. That or play just is bad freeze. Freeze. It's bad just to freeze. Hmm? You like just freezing? Well, if uh, yeah, if they, if he ends up going for the keeper on the doomsayer, that's another flame strike target. Oh, well, he does have combo, <laughs> um, and he ends up developing ice bear. So he ends up like doing the hedge play where it's like half safe, um, but also half greedy with drawing cards here. And what's really powerful to follow this up is that um, Kibler also has more ways to damage from the hand, like a second drew the claw savage or. Mm -hmm. um, so whatever minion ends up sticking, and this will be <laughs> five. Just like health. so, he's not dead again. Okay. Yeah. Do you think it was good to start with the face? If it was ice block, it was probably better to just go double trains and then using the face to let him at two and not at four. As I just a small thing. Uh, yeah, it'd probably be better. Uh, if he knew that. Wait, no, no, I think he would have gotten the one with that play. Cause at at the okay, so he took fourteen. What to do? What to do? Right. Uh, yes. So is that nineteen total health? Yes. So is that eleven? If he was at eleven, you want to do face first, put him to nine. First train puts him at five. Second one puts him at one. Third one procs block at one. I think his he was at twelve. I think his play was correct in both okay. situations. Okay. Fair enough. Fair enough. Um, is he, is he dead no matter what he does here? Um, because his opponent has a Drew the Claw. Yeah, I believe so. He has to kind of draw into another option, but he has no draw in his hand right now. So it looks like, uh, Forsen is gone. Looks like Kibler remains undefeated two weeks of, uh, Archon League. That's right. Well, uh, unless, uh, barring any catastrophe where, uh, you know, Kibler doesn't see this lethal, <clears throat> but 
Druidic oh, Call Sniper Torch should be it. Well, look, I, I mean, there's always been the case where we can come to those assumptions, and sometimes, uh... Oh, no, he has to play the Keeper. The Never Lucky. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. All right, well, Gibbler's done for the day and the week. And Forsen's done for now. Forsen is benched, and that's two oh, losses in uh -oh. a row. Forsen got benched. Oh, man, I got to wow. update this in the... From the undefeated to benched. That's a pretty good advantage yeah. for... Team Value Town now because they know what to expect and they know what to not play against. Yeah, that's right. Um, we only have Rogue, Warrior, and Hunter as a possibility for Team Forsen boys. And also Team Forsen boys was also really confident coming out to uh, week number two. They they had a really good showing in week one defeating Temple Storm. And they were feeling really confident because the way it happened, it's like, well, you know, we won five straight games and then Druid kind of struggled a little bit. But it happens because Druid has that draw wild, growth through bust type of mentality. But it's not going so smoothly now as the, the overlay says it's 2-1, but it's actually 3-1 as Dog, yeah. Kibler, uh, uh, actually Dog, Kibler, and Kibler took three games here. Uh, now, now that I think about it, it seems uh, that as a team, perhaps the strategy was was not very good to send out Forsen because uh, if he does if he does win the game, I mean, sure, he wins the game, but so can anyone else. But if he loses a game, he's benched, and the other team is restricted to three classes, as you said. So it seems like you're you're taking a, a senseless risk uh, yeah. at the early stage of the tournament. Can I, I make a prediction? If... Oh, okay. Go ahead, Ardy. I was going to make one, but i like to hear yours. I would like to say that the dog will go for Rogue, because he knows that he's not going to face Freeze Mage. And if um, Team Forsome Boys predicts that, they will either go for Chucky's Hunter, if he's Face Hunter, or for Oskaka's Control Warrior or Patron Warrior to try to counter the Rogue. Mm -hmm. That's what I think is going to happen, because Team Valuton will try to make use of Force and being benched and not play around Freeze Mage or Zoo. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. I was going to bring up the same, but maybe even talk about Paladin too, because Paladin would struggle against Freeze Mage, like you said. Uh, but in this case, it's oh. not going to be an answer to the Rogue directly. It'd be a Rogue versus Rogue with Oskaka versus Dog. Yeah. Uh -oh. Uh oh. Call the ambulance. Uh oh. It's bad news Wait. for Forcing Boys. <laughs> maybe they think Rogue important. is the best answer to Rogue. There's no way that is the case. Maybe Oskaka's Rogue runs Harrison or something like that. Okay. Uh, it, it, it seems like you're right with Dog picking Rogue, but um, again, like even even if Harrison is in there, isn't that pretty close to a 50-50? You still have to get the card. Yeah, it is. Maybe just they didn't think about it or they just random picked, which is correct, but in the situation of a player being benched, I think you can try to pick. Of wow. course, now that everybody's going to watch, and if somebody from us is going to be picked, they will know how I think and try to counter us. So there's like a lot of mind games going on. Okay. Yeah, that's, oh, that's a really good point, RDU, because um, in the end, you can play Nash Equilibrium, right? And then you can also just randomize it, and then it equals out to be 50-50 either way. Yeah. So I think the, the key here is just... That if Value Town does get the win, though, they're in a really good spot because then they just ride uh, Trump all the way home, right? And His also, the thing, or not, or they can just ride that mid range pallet and all the way down <laughs> have to, see. <laughs> to the gutters. Yeah. Yeah. Also, Frodon, the thing you said about mid range pallet, and it has a really bad matchup uh, thrown away, the freeze mage, but also the best matchup possibly, the zoo one from Forsen, because I expect Forsen is going to play zoo thrown okay. away. So, like, you don't really want to go for the Paladin. So it was pretty obvious that uh, Value Town is going to play Rogue. Damn, it was obvious. Oof. Like, they had to do that. Like they are you. pretty forced to do that. Yeah. yeah. Fair enough, fair enough. All right, um, taking a look at how this opening hands look. Uh, well, Dog's hand looks fairly aggressive. He's got the two uh, weapon buffs plus a Disarray and Blade Flurries. And his opponent looks like it's more, um, it's a little bit slower, but it's more board centric. Look, dog equipping a deadly poison here. Now, so, Artie, this is like a really intricate matchup, and I know you love talking a lot about it. So, uh, he's just trying to answer whatever comes out, like if it's a pilot shredder or it's a violet teacher, right? By equipping this deadly poison out early. Yeah, you want to equip deadly poison early if you can, if you have a spare mana. 
You also don't want to play the naked Violet teacher because she can get destroyed by oh, Deadly Poison SI. At the same time, you don't really want to play Shredder because he can get destroyed by Sap. You want to use prep as early as possible, even with a sprint. Like, if I would get prep sprint, I would probably keep that in the starting hand because it's such a good tempo, just gaining the cards early. Because at one point, you will have to sprint. So if you sprint on turn 4, you can afford to not sprint all the rest of the game. And when your opponent will sprint himself, you can just destroy him by making a power play on turn 7. Mm -hmm. ha, this guy's a toast. But yeah, you seeing often... That, uh, oh, sorry, continue. I say you, you often see that like uh, turn where they have to sprint and just lose the game from there immediately if they don't draw like a blade flurry combo. Yeah, blade flurry combos are something you need to play around in this matchup because you know that your opponent is going to have them at some point or another. Hmm. Thanos backstab is pretty inefficient, so he'll probably coin a sigh. Oh, for Seer, sorry. Mm -hmm. He's saving that uh, that weapon shard so he can get big blade flurry next turn, or like for a better value on the sharp sword oil. Yeah, he just wants a bigger weapon, uh, and I, I guess um, what RDU was saying about Harrison potentially being in Oskaka's deck um, does seem to be like a huge advantage. It's just you still you still need to draw the card, you still need it in the right spot. So even like a really powerful tech card like that, you know, I think the most you're gonna get out of that is like a five percent advantage. You think so? Isn't it like a really huge tempo swing to get Harrison? Yeah, but you, you actually need to draw Harrison and play it and in the right spot. Like, the yeah, chance of I that guess. is not that high. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, we can keep it in the middle again. Yeah. Low dev is pretty huge. What an Just awkward denies, hand. Yeah, it denies the whole turn. I think you have to trade Thanos and try to draw into a play. Any play. Do you have to trade Talnos? It seems like you have so much stuff that's affected by spell damage that um, just going face might require your opponent to spend three damage killing Talnos. Hmm. Yeah, it's true. He's got a equipped a deadly poison. He'd have to have um, a fan of knives for it to be card efficient to deal with um, Thanos, hmm. but maybe not even mana efficient. He cannot really afford to skip turn five. So, going for the draw is a really good play. Like, he, she should value, like, even his opponent using free damage to kill his Thanos, is it that worth it? If it's a weapon, yeah, it might be. Um, but, like, what what's the chance he actually draws something that's playable? So you have the Azure Drake, you have your own Lothab, you have maybe a Piloted Treader or two. Is there anything else? Like, an SI doesn't really do anything, that just dies to the weapon the same as Thanos mm. would. So he basically had to like value if it's better to go for the 30% or 20 something percent to draw into an out that he can play or just pass the turn and trade Talnos for a free damage dagger 100% of the time. Hmm. Is, is it even 20%? That's kind of what I'm asking. Uh, it's close to that I think. It's probably like 4, yeah, I think it's about 20, maybe a little bit less. So he either went for the 20% yeah. or just 100%. I think you have to go for the high risk, high, high reward plays. At least in this format where you have to win with uh, only two decks. Well, it worked I out. Went, uh, I mean, it, it baited out the uh, the fan and he would have drawn an anti killbot. Yeah, killbot was pretty bad there. He could like trade a weapon and then killbot, semi kill the low tip. Yeah, here we're going to see a, a prep uh, oil, and I think he's just going to face into Lothed. Hmm. I think he goes face. Okay. Yeah. He shows his opponent he has Blade Flurry, but does he really care? Like, if his opponent is not going to play any monster, he still wins. Mm hmm. And now Oskaka is probably going to play Deckhand and Tinker with this and just go for face himself. <laughs> it's a face battle. I mean, when you have this much damage, though, Oscar, I mean, if you can count each oil as six damage, plus the eight from Eviscerate and the two from so um, from the Thanos, that's 22 damage. So it's like, that's a lot. Plus, uh, the oil lands on a minion. Forgot about that. So that's nine damage that you can kind of count in. Uh, that's, that's pretty ridiculous, I think. 
So there should be a race turned on here, at least from Oskaka's end, because all his hand is basically telling him to go aggressive. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. He goes for the wild play. I wonder if if it hits the deck hand, is it better to trade the deck hand or just eviscerate it still? I think it's still better to eviscerate it. It's yeah, always probably better to eviscerate it. multiple threats. Yeah. Double like, kill bot. Interesting. Oh yeah, it, man, second heal bot. I don't think you'd ever actually sacrifice the deck hand there. It's absolutely not worth it because you're just saving eviscerate for face later on, and you might as well just hit five for face with the deck hand. Yeah. The move run double <laughs> heal bot bots everywhere. Oh my goodness. It makes rogue more consistent if you think about it, and that's what the deck needs. But rogue needs more card draw, more consistent card draw. Since auctioneer went nerfed. It, it also needs struggles. more healing. I mean, Rogue is the only deck that uses Earthen Ring Farseers anymore, right? Yeah, not even Handlock uses them anymore. Yeah. I think uh, Maligos Warlock still uses Earthen Ring Farseers. Perhaps. But we didn't see that deck being played for a lot of time because it just loses to Patron, and there are not that many Handlocks in the meta. Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty interesting. They, you know, they put an antique heal bot, which is like a minion that's oh, supposed man. to like help out control decks and stuff. But then it costs five mana, so it doesn't really help out control decks very much. It's just a really good anti aggro tool. He misses the fifty mm. fifty for three more damage. Unlucky. Seven damage yeah. weapon though. Uh, looks like he's gonna Four get now. flurried pretty hard here though. You cannot really play around the second flurry. Yeah, it's, like a, it's unlikely. This is how the rogue mirrors usually go. Just flurries back and forth. Heal bots, Azri Drakes. It's a really aggressive tempo battle. Also race-ish. Like they try to mm -hmm. see who has the most damage in a fast amount of time. Oh my god. <laughs> so we we'll see all four flurry, flurries this game. Uh, and we'll also see just like a lot of cards being drawn here. Unless Oskaka wants to go for the Azure Drake for the board presence, but I think Sprint here is the better option. Sprint is better because you can draw into a far series. Oh, he runs Harry Sun and did. Wow. So so maybe that's why they thought it's better to go for Rogue versus Rogue. Yeah, mm -hmm. but again, he, he didn't draw it in time. I mean, like all the weapon cards are basically out at this stage. Yeah, as yeah. you said, Creep, like 5% probably was right. As you said it. Harrison doesn't add that much. You have to draw him at the same time. You, your opponent has a weapon. He's wow. so close to potentially killing his opponent too. Lotheb will be really key too if you can shut down his opponent's spells. And he can gather damage. Because the key is he just doesn't actually have damage to kill his opponent unless his Azuric sticks. At this point Lotheb is probably the best card you can draw. Mm -hmm. Like. If we'd see Oskaka drawing Lotep now, he would just win. And if he doesn't play Lotep or something powerful now, Dog is gonna play Lotep himself and put Oskaka on a in a bad spot. Is the play here to um to Drake and Blade Flurry? Do you have anything else? Not really. Uh well. I don't think Sap even allows you to do anything else. Like, Sap usually helps you gain tempo to do something on the board in combination with it, but mm -hmm, yeah. it doesn't really do anything here. It lets you keep your blade, your weapon, so if he plays Drake again and he can't kill you, then you can Blade Flurry. Well, but you can Blade Flurry and re-weapon up an attack, just to push for a little bit extra yeah. damage. That also works. And then maybe you can draw into something from uh, Harrison. Yeah, but... Not gonna happen here. Sap and Lotheb and SI7 agent. Uh, I think that's gonna be it. This guy's yeah, I don't see Oskaka getting out of this. There's no card that really pulls Rogue out here that's in the traditional oil Rogue deck. Is there? No, there's, no, there's no nothing. Like maybe Healbot can let you survive. We have yeah. the second Healbot, but other than that, I wouldn't see any other card. If there was no Lotheb, though, I mean, look at some of the plays available to Oskaka this turn. It would have been crazy. Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah there's, there's really nothing Oskaka can do to prevent lethal. Uh, there is, if he assumes that Eviscerate is not in the hand of Dog, but it is. I think, considering that, there's nothing to be done. 
Uh, even if he gets heal bot from Azure Drake, it's not good enough. Even if he saps Lothib, it's not good enough. That's right. And it's not like um, there's anything else he can draw with Azure Drake that could help pull him out here either. Let's see. Nope. Certainly not that. Not preparation for five at least. That's it. Valley Town goes up 4-1. And Kibler and Dog are done for the day, meaning that Team Captain Trump is going to have to take home uh, the victory here. He has to win with his Paladin and his Warrior up against, oh, pretty much anybody. Oh, no. Uh, actually, Forsen's still benched, right? Because yes, no, uh, we have to see benched. a member of Forsen Boys actually win in order to f get Forsen off the bench. Yeah, because he's ice cold right now. So that means that Trump is going to go for Warrior, <clears throat> which says Oskaka is going to go for Rogue, most likely. It's going to be a really hard uh, spot for Trump, knowing his teammates went 2-0. It's a really bad spot. Uh, the more games you lose, the more tilted you go, usually. I don't think Trump is the person that is going to go on tilt, Yeah, but uh, it's going to be hard. kind of snaps a little bit, don't you think? Yeah, when you have to lose for the team, it's hard. Yeah, it's especially when, when, cause like Trump probably convinced his teammates that it's like, hey guys, this mid range paladin is really good. Trust yeah, me, kind of. I'm not going to bring Warlock. I'm yeah. going to bring Paladin. <laughs> yeah. Wait, so yeah, you have. Consider Warlock to be one of the best decks in Conquest. So. Right. You have a few of these like uh, added pressure dynamics that kind of contribute to perhaps some tilt, perhaps some rushed or bad play. So I wouldn't be too surprised if we do see it from May himself, but. Uh, well, I hope not. I don't think so. I think uh, if there's anything I've learned from witnessing the rap battle yesterday with Trump, mm -hmm. that he doesn't get rattled easily. I think people can throw some mean words or even tough situations, but the mayor of Value Town will come through once again. And uh, you know, one thing, too, is that Trump's gotten a lot of experience. I think back in the past when we were first watching him play Fight Night and Trump was still getting used to you know the spotlight of Mm. being one of the guys that people look to in Hearthstone. He was still feeling a lot of that pressure. Remember in Fight Night, he couldn't win at all, Grip, until like his very last match, I think, where he finally yeah. got a win with that weird mage deck. Um, yeah. That was like a, a big key moment for Trump to be like, wow, I finally won. But since then, I think he's certainly been able to be a lot more calm and collected. In, uh, all right. Well, he's going to have to be. It is uh, Paladin versus Warrior. This seems pretty unusual. But uh, what also is pretty interesting is that it is uh, Ostkaka coming out again. Uh, I believe if he loses... He's Trump, benched. He, Trump knows yeah, exactly he's who he's playing against. <laughs> oh, so that's the... Um, I guess that's the logic that if you play Paladin, you can directly corner that Hunter with the Warrior deck. Um, although it's probably patron, right? I don't know if Trump would be busting out the Control Warrior right now. Control Warrior is coming back. Control Warrior ended number one on Europe. The double roll Control Warrior is definitely something viable in a patron meta. But I'm not sure if in the six deck the format is the best uh, call. Because you're going to be vulnerable to so many things. Like Druids mm -hmm. or even Midrange Paladin. I have to say that watching this tournament so far, it's even though some teams have had like a good head start, it's been like a very unfavorable um, like finish. Um, so the last few matches, you kind of have to win some bad ones. Uh, but it seems the way things have been set up here is that Value Town's really doing all right all the way to the end here, and it just seems like uh, the bench rule is really perhaps even benching Force and Boys out of the tournament today. Let, let's see. Oh, crib. Very elegant. Let's not but... go that far. Let's see how good the Midrange Paladin is. That, that's true. I mean, Conquest, you're only as good as your, your weakest deck, so to speak. Um, maybe not necessarily weak in power level, but in terms of how it matches up. If this Paladin goes 0-6, I mean, that's, that's another story in itself. But I, I don't anticipate that happening. Paladin's one of those decks... Uh, it used to be compared to Druid, in fact, um, mm -hmm. because it just falls into wins based off its curve and having really powerful tempo plays that can't get stopped because uh, a deck's bound to draw poorly against Paladin eventually. That's right. Uh, okay. it's, it's a pretty nice hand from uh, Oskaka. He's mainly just missing the draw. Yes, this is the Patron Warrior, the Grim Patron Warrior, which... Um, 
people are starting to, you know, a little tweak here and there, but also people aren't loving it as much as they used to because they're starting to realize how to play better against the Grim Patron Warrior. People are very cautious about leaving things with less than three attack on the board. Um, people are teching in very aggressively against weapons, sometimes even going as far as, you know, Acidic Swamp Ooze and the Harrison Jones to try to remove the double death spite. So I, I would assume that Trump is very... Uh, you know, aware of the weaknesses of Paladin against Patreon, and we'll try to mitigate them accordingly. All right. Well, we see the typical, I'll play a dude on turn two and pass play. Well, I mean, he wanted a mini bot, but it, at least you get uh, something on the board. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's actually fine to play muster here. It commits you to play the Owl next turn, but I don't think there's much wrong with that. It might be wrong because when you see that stable good, you expect Acolyte of Pain and you want to Owl that usually to deny the draws from the Patron player because if the Patron player gets for his draws, he just uh, combos you and he wins. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, any combo deck in general, you just don't want them to draw, whether it's uh, this deck or Miracle back in the day. What? Just no. anything to keep them from being able to get the gas to put the fuel on. Paladin is not the best deck to do that. He needs like perfect curve to be able to beat Miracle or to beat Patron nowadays. And we don't see Trump drawing that well this game. Yeah, but what kind of play does Trump have this turn then? Like, Consecration? Well... Uh, I mean, you, you talked about him not playing the Owl. Like, he's basically committed to playing the Owl and the Acolyte. Which is yeah, consistent right. with, which is what you were saying. But that doesn't seem very good either. It's okay. It's 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 actually pretty significant though. It's not maybe it's not good in the sense that you don't have a good board presence considering that this you know this unstable will challenges everything. But yeah. denying the draw is really big because after Warrior ends up using a lot of these resources, he doesn't he's got a lot of like answers to stuff, but you have to rem remember that Paladin eventually will play bigger threats mm -hmm. and he has to use these cards in order to get the, the board to stabilize. Imagine though he actually had a Grim Patron there, that would have been four Grim Patrons on the board already. Oh, well, that's a good point. Could have coined he it out. He opted to throw that away in the Mulligan. I don't. I think it was a good decision because you don't really want to keep Green Patron in your starting hand unless you're facing uh, another warrior. Mm -hmm. Yeah, against Paladin, Green Patron is like usually a board clear mechanism, and uh, getting the draw before you get to the that me mechanic into your deck is really important as well. You can also just make four patrons on turn five and put them. To have equality consecration, if they don't have both cards, you just mm -hmm. win. It's really aggressive as well. Mm -hmm. Opting to coin here to get uh, a little bit of a bigger board at the end of the turn. He didn't mm -hmm. have to coin, he could have just traded in the Acolyte. The slam was probably getting value later on anyway. So I guess he, he thinks he doesn't really need to combo very quickly. And I think he's right in that assumption. The Paladin deck is a very strong deck, but it's a very slow deck. And generally, combo decks do well against any slow deck, regardless of the counters. Well, um, Trump doesn't really have much to do here. Most of her battle is terrible in this scenario, so I guess you're just going to do, do uh, the true server champion. You could have went for Master for battle if, you had, if your opponent didn't have a board, because even if he makes patrons, you have equality consecration, but now he has he had board and he also had the the weapon, which just deals yeah. with master. Yeah, for sure. But Trump might want to bait out Osaka to play the patron combo on turn eight because he has equality consecration, and if he deals with one patron combo, then he just has one more, and if he deals with that, he's in a really good spot. That's the way Paladin oh. wins usually. Wow. wow, that's three pair boys. Yeah. That sucks. That's like, terrible considering that he needed to drop a threat and mm -hmm. patron passing implies that he's got a lot of like situational combo pieces, so uh you'd like to be able to present something onto the board, but not really in this scenario. And yeah, the reason two of the same cards is really bad in general is um like you generally just want more options. Often the only card you want more than once is uh, like a direct damage card, like if you're playing uh, Hunter and you're doing okay, having two kill command is pretty good.
But other than that, it's uh, often a huge liability. Well, whirlwind draw here is not exactly the most helpful. The thing is, Grim Patron is much better spot just passing than Paladin is because Paladin can't really truly stop the combo from happening. And what what's also really annoying too is that um, you know Paladin's hero power is naturally su susceptible to things like whirlwind clearing and also getting more damage onto the Falling Berserker or even the Grim Patron like you mentioned. So this is... Looking like Oskaka is pretty comfortable here, honestly, even though like nothing's really happening in the past couple turns. Yeah. Yeah, it's at absolutely time, true. At the same time you expect Tyrion from the Paladin player on turn eight. So you're kind of afraid that if he plays Tyrion, you're in not such a good spot. But we see that he has slam, so he can deal with that. Yeah, he's in okay shape. Uh, also because Trump would have to basically waste the true silver charge just to drop armor by four. Um, I mean, what you were talking about, uh, Fred, is, is, is really the key. Um, you know, Trump is not the one who's... Oh, oh. He heals the warrior <laughs> so he can't battle rage. Yeah. That's interesting. And he's going to mill for one. Man, Trump's hand was so bad. Yeah. And now he's got Dr. Boom, which is reasonable. But yeah, back, back to what you were saying. You know, Trump's not the one who has to draw out like a 60 damage combo through taunt. Like, uh, the, the Grim Patient Warriors, what you know, no. if you just give them enough time, you literally can't win. Yeah, and time is what Oskaka has at the moment, but, I mean, he's also, he's also taking this turn. Like, this is something that uh, I think players who are trying to make that jump into, you know, the competitive scene, like, even though you know you're going to pass, start counting right now, no. like, what you can do on 9 mana, um, and just take the opportunity. So, everyone was like, well, what's Oskaka doing? It's, He's like making sure that if a card is played, how much damage does he have? He's got three, four whirlwind effects. Well, he only can use three because the problem is cool die. But it's worth keeping count just in case. If Trump goes for Dr. Boom and Minibot and he gets unlucky, Osaka probably has lethal with frauding. If the bombs don't kill frauding. Or yeah. the um or the other guys involved. Sometimes when you play a uh, Grim Patron. Versus Dr. Boom. Uh, the Grim Patient that just spawned dies, yeah. or the Warsong Commander dies. And it's you don't, awesome. You well, don't really care if, if Warsong dies. Yeah, yeah, even the Warsong dies. It gives, with its last dying breath, it gives the Grim Patient charge. Yeah, it depends how soon that happens, though. Yeah. We, we, we've all seen the highlights where, you know, against Dr. Boom, you see Warsong Commander, Grim Patron. Grim Patient goes into the, the, the bomb. And then the bomb immediately kills the Warsong, so you have one charging 3-3, which doesn't seem so overpowered anymore. I think Trump doesn't want to play the minibot because it's just so resilient to things like Whirlwind, so it gets more damage. Um, at least if he Whirlwinds, this 1-1 one, one Silverhand Recruit will bite the dust and be only one additional damage for the Frothing Berserker. How much damage is this, are you? Use your elite mat skills. Um, you can get a floating to like 15 or 17, so like 20 something. It's not little. Okay. Well, if, if the bomb, this deck sucks. If the bomb but... <laughs> Only <Yeah>. 15, man. <laughs> I mean, I can do that with Druid from the hand with only two cards. Yeah. You might want to play Patron. But you know your opponent has Equality Consecration, so you probably don't want. Emperor would be like the MVP here. The Boombots are annoying. Uh, at the same time, your opponent having a lot of minions on the board is the way you get lethal soon. I, I yeah, like the, uh, just the Execute here. Buy more time. You needed to play something because otherwise you're going to mill next turn and you're, you're striving for more combo pieces, which Execute is not. Is Master Quarter Master too greedy? I, I feel yes. like that's a little bit too many minions. Just because it's seven minions on the board, right? And then your opponent has um has like a full hand. <laughs> Every if he has two Fathing Berserkers and a war song, and then he just like whirlwinds twice, that's an extra third twenty-eight damage because of four. Yeah, 
Trump's laughing right now. I mean, he realizes it's, it's like, you know, okay, so I haven't played anything, but if I actually start to play stuff, I'll die. <laughs> like, go to unleash the hounds. Can Oskaka afford to use the weapon on the face and then play the frauding combo and still win? He probably can, because he has free whirlwind effects. Let me calculate it fast. Not fast enough, are you? Yeah, it's exactly lethal. This is exactly... It's actually, no, no, it's 32 damage. If you go for face, and then you play the combo. Because you deal 4, and then he has 5 monsters on the board, you will have 3. So that's like 8. You get the whirlwind twice, that's 16 on the frauding. Then you attack, it's, it's 18 on the frauding. And then the... More. It's more than 32. Because of uh, inner rage, and you can use the ghoul. Oh, I didn't count inner rage. But yeah, it's lethal. It's, nice, it's, pretty good deck. it's way, way, way more than this. <laughs> pretty good deck. Actually, you might need to kill the unstable ghoul now. You can in a rage it. Yeah. Or you can in a rage the bird um, monster and trade. My inner rage just adds nothing. Well, it adds damage. Um. No. Oh, I thought you can use it on the frog music. Yeah, but it's, <laughs> that's, that's, that's oh, it's actually not lethal. Is it? It's no. not lethal. Oh, he's okay. three off. Oh. Yeah, it's, it's not lethal because the dudes were at free HP. Yeah. See, the, the, the last whirling is not as good as the other ones. Oh, wow. Damn it. Big Game Hunter was basically Iron Forge Rifleman. So both me and Luskaka miscounted this. Yeah. But does he still have lethal next turn with yes. uh, yeah, six does. damage? I think so. Yeah, he has eight. Uh, eight plus three. Yeah. Yeah. It's 11. He has eleven. I can do this math. I got it, guys. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I I know why I miscounted. I didn't count the first whirlwind from the Death's Bite. I assumed he can do four whirlwinds and get max value and four whirlwinds. Whereas the first whirlwind doesn't matter because you have to use it to just clear the bombs. He would have had lethal if he would just YOLO it and risk frotting dying to bombs. That's it. That would have never worked out. <laughs> you think so? They yeah. just hit face all the time. When there's no, when there's when there's like this much on the line, the chance that you get unlucky is a hundred percent. Hundred percent? One hundred percent. That's right. Yeah. Alright, well, uh, you know, I think that's going to be it for game number six. Force and Boys gets back onto the board, but most importantly, you know what this means? Force and's unbenched, I believe. Yeah. Yeah. You can get back unbenched. in there. That yeah. means that uh, Trump is going to keep Paladin, probably. And it's like either Oskaka's Rogue or Force and Freeze Mage is going to come out. I think Oskaka's Rogue is the best choice because you have good matches versus either Paladin or Warrior. And you also like deal with Oskaka. So then, like, only Chucky and Force I need to win. Now, I should remind uh, you guys watching that even though a team might lose the points that they get in the losing position, uh, they, they are relevant when it comes to tiebreakers at the end of the season. So even, even though, like, uh, Valley Town has a sizable lead here, if uh, Trump is stuck on, like, Paladin is the last deck. You can you can bet Force and Boys are gonna clean up with all the best matchups first before maybe they end up losing. And I feel right. that's that's largely a weakness with the Paladin. Like if if Trump saves the Paladin for last, uh, that will absolutely happen because it has such bad matchups in some cases, where the Grim Patient Warrior, well, not really. Nothing really really beats Grim Patient Warrior. Certainly, it's no uh, Paladin versus Freeze Mage matchup. Yeah, so I was just looking at uh, the classes as well. So I, I think you're, you guys are pretty much right on. Um, well, I, I actually haven't seen Chalky been able to be played in a while too. So I think it'd be nice to have him mix in if you expect uh, Trump to be playing the Paladin. But For Forsten wants revenge. More Forsten, mage. Forsten wants to get the win. I don't know, man. Do you think he thought long and hard? During his time on the bench? Uh, I don't know. Towel over the head. Maybe he's like, let me at him, let me at him. And then, you know, it's like, fine. Uh, we actually don't see what Trump has queued up with. There it is, Paladin. So, okay, so for Forshaw's going to get the win here. I think the chance that Paladin wins is um, 
Maybe as bad as single digits. Single digits? Not really. They can curve up are perfectly. You, are you... Okay, so you're saying based like one out of every like 15 plus games, the Paladin will win. I've I've seen this matchup in tournaments like quite a few times, and I've never ever seen the Paladin win. I've seen the Paladin win a few times, um, but the I've seen Strife Crow won last week. This matchup, yeah. exactly, exactly this matchup. Really? Yeah, he did. Mid range Paladin. Yes. Oh, I, I, I didn't see Strife Crow play mid range Paladin. If I didn't see it, it didn't happen, guys. <laughs> yeah, but the, the rules of Hearthstone don't necessarily apply to the gods like Strife Crow. Yeah. But I think, generally speaking, you're, you're absolutely correct. I mean, any deck can win. Um, Freeze Mage can draw really poorly. Paladin can draw excellently. And uh, it's, you know, even if Freeze Mage draws poorly, it generally can deal with Paladin. But don't also forget that there might be tech that we don't know from Trump that whips out randomly. Like, what if all of a sudden Trump decides to go full Asia region and just put Kazan Mystics in his deck? And we just didn't see it. Yeah. Also, I there feel is... his hand is, is pretty bad, double zombie chow. Because <laughs> they, they, they just don't really pay out in terms of, uh, like, face damage. Like, zombie chow is great for board control, but there isn't much to control when it comes to the freeze mage. Yeah. Yeah, I guess so. But if you. I mean, it is a body target for Blessing of Kings, so you can do enough damage with it, so that That's way... That's true, Blessing of Kings. That is yeah. a great card. Oh, Force of Shake in his head is like more Ice Barrier. <laughs> has it been six Ice Barriers now? I believe it has. I haven't seen him really draw his Mad Scientist other than that one game where Kibbutz silenced it. <laughs> Seems like he's been drawing the secrets instead. <laughs> Is it better to master for battle or just coin the kings? No, if you coin kings, you get fireballed. You have you have to play master first. Yeah, it's like the same damage, anyways. If they survive and you kings next turn, yep. right? But kings is more damage because it does the damage right away. Uh, so with kings you do four now and four next turn. With master into kings you do zero now and then next turn you do eight. Okay. So it should yeah. be the same. Oh my goodness. A little more. <laughs> Quarter <don't> master. <laughs> right on curve. That's, oh, that, that's the way you mean. not happy about that. Wow. Okay. Okay, guys. Uh, the Paladin's totally favored in this matchup. Uh, <laughs> yeah, the, the chance I, of the Freeze Mage winning, I think Crip said, was single digits. No, no, no. no. I, I just had my chart upside down. So, you know, now, now we just flip it around to see the truth of it. I would say was like, Oh, gotcha, gotcha. Yeah. I would say it's 35. <laughs> 35 65 oh, is yeah. like a fair percentage. That's what we get for having uh so that's what we get for for saying something that one sided and decisive, right? As soon as you say like, oh yeah, there's just like no chance. Yeah, I'm just gonna blow it out. Can you guys please not sap me? I like casting this tournament. <laughs> don't right. don't sap the crip. Wait <laughs> I'm pretty sure if you avoid saying anything offensive in conflict, <laughs> it'll be just fun. Alright. He's got a heal bot too, so this is like a lot of ways to be um, okay post Alex Strauss, if it even lasts that long, but I don't think it will. Mm. The if, funny thing is that he gets lethal this turn. Next turn, if he gets the owl from the top deck while playing through silver now, he can owl something and then Blessing of Kings it. Most likely not though, because the Blizzard will kill the zombie chow and heal him up for five more health. Oh, yeah. So that unfortunately won't be the case um, on Trump's end, but Forsen does have a lot of stall, and he does have Alex Straza. So if he can deal with this board, because two blizzards will kill everything, I mean, there's still that chance. What do you think of playing Kings on Zombie Chow? Is that a weird play? Uh, you mean this turn? Yeah, yeah it's pretty good, actually. Uh, that's actually really good. Yeah, because the choose over is going to be doing. You're not going to be killing him next turn anyway, so you still need two turns to kill to hit with choose over champion. So you do protect mm -hmm. him. It's a good point. Uh, something maybe worth evaluating in the future if Trump ever goes back and analyzes the vod for four hours on stream. Okay. <laughs> um, well, I think here you definitely have to kings, and you, I don't think you need to save your true silver charge. 
because really the main thing you're afraid of is like a doomsayer or something. Uh, you have the BGH for a possible Alistraza. You have the Equality Consecrate against uh, a doomsayer. So I think here you just want a King's your Quartermaster so it survives Flame Strike or another Blizzard. Yeah, I like King's there too. And I definitely want it on the Quartermaster because if the Mage does Flame Strike, you don't want it to die next turn to a pink. Yeah, I'm not, sure why, I'm not sure why Trump keeps the Blessing of King for. That might be like a small tilting play. Yeah, it could be the idea that he wants to uh, surprise his opponent with it. I wouldn't like to be in Trump's spot right now. I was there last week, but with Agro Paladin. Yeah. It's a really oh, bad spot losing. to lose for the team. Yeah. Well, I mean, Forsen's in a similar spot too. <laughs> Yeah, but first one is in the winning spot with Freeze Mage. Yeah, like Crip said, Palin has single digits percent chance to win this game. Uh, it is actually looking extremely bad for the Palin. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. I never doubted you for a second. Oh, oh! It looks like my chart wasn't upside down after all. Okay. No, no, no! You know, you, it was it was upside down <laughs> after you flipped it around the first time, Doctor. Right, right, <laughs> right. But uh, I guess you get what you pay for when it comes to when it comes to predictions like that. Doomsayer to try to stall for time. Mm hmm. Because he wants to go for the Alex Straza plays next turn and go for the the kill, I believe. I think this is a good opportunity for uh, equality consecrate. Why not just push for lethal and hope he doesn't have Alex? I wonder. Does doesn't that do that? Yeah, I think you're one off, right? There's yeah, the ice barrier off. though, so it's actually not it's, one. Then you should probably test with one of the other minions first and buff the Aldor just in case it's ice barrier to kill the Dumser. Well, what about actually equality kings, like a compromise play? Equality Kings. Yeah, Equal that looks nice. Equality, so the Peacekeeper kills the Doomsayer, and you can push for 12 damage. How do you That's answer Alex nice. Straza, though? It's like, isn't this... It feels like a pretty obvious Alex Straza uh, setup, so you can't actually kill it next turn. Well, I guess you can if you just trade a minion. Big Game Hunter finally fights fair against big minions. Can equality cons next turn? Big game hunter the becomes the big game. <laughs> oh. Wow. How right. do you think of mastering there over hero power to get like a potential lethal with quarter master? But I don't think you can, yeah, he can actually, Alex Straza. Like for some, he cannot Alex Straza this turn. There's no way he can. Mm -hmm. He's like dead. Yeah, that's a good point. Also, like, Master would have set up Lethal, just in case of Alex Raza. But Master is bad versus another area of effect spell, which you already seen two Blizzards. And if for some Flame Strikes this board, he loses. So I like Master more than Hero Power. Okay. What to do? He really wants to play Emperor Thorson. Um, in order to follow it up, he most likely will have to stall on the board, like Frostbolting the... Big game hunter, but by playing fireball, he foregoes his chance of playing the emperor. Well, Forsen, yeah, all, all he's doing is slowing the game down more and more every single mm -hmm. turn, bit by bit. And um, I mean, you can't blame him. He he was Forsen was in like an unbelievably bad spot at the start. Still stabilized, slowed down the game enough to where we're at this stage. Um, you can't really like, especially after seeing the last game. You can't really believe there are many threats left from the Paladin at this stage. Uh, Tyrion well, is a pretty he, good he draw. Drew, he drew one of those threats. Yeah, he did. <laughs> Tyrion Ford Ring. I mean, that's that's really hard to stop because if the Ashbringer ever comes out, it's just you can't freeze the face every single turn. Mm -hmm. uh, Do you like trading there? I really don't like trading because there's a chance your opponent just draws into the last secret and then you de deny the scientist. And he also he wants free to damage. protect the Divine Shield, though. So yeah. if Alex Raza comes down, he can use Tyrion to trade easily and not have to give up uh, the equality or something. Uh, I'm not sure. Yeah, maybe. If you waited it up. 
Well, Forsen's thinking of uh, drawing a bunch of cards and then maybe setting up for an Emperor turn and then maybe setting up for an Alistraza. But is that a little bit too slow? It's huh? kind of slow, but that's what you have to do. Yeah. He still has Hold double Ice Block. Alright, uh, 6, 10, 12, 13. Hmm. Now, should Trump over draw Forsen? Mm. Because they get close to the <laughs> You were saying that uh, you don't think it's that big of a deal. He's, only, he's, he's got 10 cards left in the deck. It's not really uh, that much fatigue. You can only make one. Make? Just one. Just one, okay. It's not worth it. Yeah, it's probably not worth it. Then, all face, no space. Uh, y yeah. We can run with that. All, all face, no space. What's the no space for? It's oh, no, okay. no, no room for anything else, man. Yeah. Just all face. Oh no, no, no! I thought it was supposed to be um, callback to how people used to say Kappa. Or gray face, no space. <clears throat> uh, well, I guess we just push for damage here. Consecration doesn't get much better, so there's like not a lot of minions that Freeze Mage tends to play. Tyrion already gets one hit in. I mean, Paladin really still do this, right? He really needs a Nova there. He did not get it. Mm. You, you just have to protect your uh, your block here while you Emperor. Yeah, and the heal bot here is so clutch. Just I still so think Forsen wins. Unless Tron Bronsk is on. Are you sure? It it kind of seems that way, but I'm not sure. He's how much damage does he have follow up right now? He's got um, twelve seven or he's got twelve from the two frostbolts and the fireball plus the four, so sixteen damage. Twenty. Twenty huh? damage. Oh, because of knows. Yeah, but he doesn't have mana to play it all in one turn. I think. Well, he's got emperor. He's... Hmm. Yeah, he probably iceless that. So now Trump is gonna heal first and he's gonna do half of the damage, I think. And then he's gonna draw into Pyroblast at some point and win. At the same time, if Trump draws into Lay on Hands, he can get himself out of the range. How do you deal with Alex Straw? Do you ignore her or do you mm. acknowledge it? Because how much do you really care if uh, Tyrion dies? Yeah, you actually get another good weapon. Thing. Yeah, I think you completely yeah. just ignore Alistraza here. I think you just play boom and go for face because there's yeah. a chance that uh, you win if he tries to flame strike you. As Creep said, you'll 100% win. Yeah. You think you play boom here and just don't acknowledge oh. the burn? Oh. Wow. Oh, and not acknowledge the burn. Oh, I see. Yeah. Because uh, you might 15. just have 15 damage to kill you. No, I think you're right. I think you have to heal. You, you want to play that boom, but you can't. You certainly leave the Alistraza up. I think you heal and muster. Just for some extra damage. Boom was the aggressive play, but uh, heal bot makes sense. Oh, Frost Nova. Is that... Yeah, that's what he needed. That's, that's like the key card, right? Yeah. So now he kills the Sludge Belcher. Frost Nova plays the Emperor. Mm-hmm. And uh, then he'll have 20 damage with the existing cards in his hand, but uh, his opponent can't answer Thorson, at least with just what he has, because he, um, he only has a quality. Well, I think he'll actually have more damage, um, because... Oh, because the minion's on. Yeah, you might, be, you might be able to burn a fireball on Tyrion and gain damage with an Alistraza face hit in some situations. Gotcha. It's a bit tricky. Wow, that's a card. Oh man, if Trump played Muster for Battle last he turn, the block. he yeah. would have popped the block. Oh, that's that's really intense to handle. I think Trump realizes that, but at least he can clear the minions here off the board. Again, I don't think you really truly care if Tyrion's like vulnerable to dying because you don't really you're not taking minion damage um, after this point, so you're going to be. Requiring that weapon, the Ashbringer will be threatening to pop the ice block every turn. Yeah. 
Um, but there's still not enough damage in the actual hand of the Freeze Mage yet. He's got, what, 15 damage right now? Yeah, it's not enough, but he's got a two mana ice block, and he can uh, chain freeze the Ashbringer after he clears the board. So Forsen still has like quite a few turns left in this game, and uh, that's, that's a really big deal right now because like this Paladin deck just has nothing. Sort of though, but what happens if it gets to the point? Okay. Well, what happens if it gets to the point where Doctor Boom's on the board, and you need to like flame strike or something to stabilize, and the the, the Boom bot's there? Oh, never mind. Uh, oh. Okay, so lay on hands is what Trump needs, right? Is that the only out? Because he, he can't even space. play a heal bot. He can't even play heal bot if he draws it. He doesn't have space for low dev or heal bot, yes. Oh. No. Uh oh. Yeah, that's uh, that's gonna be it. So and yeah. now, if he would have popped it last like two turns ago with the monster. Would have he won? No. No, because he could have. Forsen would have re ice blocked and pyro the second turn rather than pyro the first turn. Yeah, yeah. Right, so yeah, what he would have done was um, go the opposite direction, just play the things that would have totaled to 10 mana instead. So Forsen finally grabs his first oh, win. Not yet. Yeah, he could frostbolt at his own face, it's possible. Yes. <laughs> uh. We've seen that. No, he makes it. All right. So, Good Rob choice. Forsen takes his first win, Freeze Mage, against the Paladin and Trump. That's his third loss here with the Paladin deck. Single digits, boys. Single digits. Single digits. Yeah. All right. Well, if now the Freeze Mage is out and we recognize that it is a bad matchup, uh, and Oskaka queues up here like Rogue versus the Paladin. And then, uh, and then the series is tied, and then you have the momentum all the way on the Force and Boys side. It's funny because Trump doesn't really want to kill Warrior because there's a chance that Forsen can kill Warlock and he can get the good matchup. He wants the Paladin into Warlock no matter what. But if Force and Boys thinks of uh, how Trump thinks, they can just keep Warlock for last and uh, go for Warlock into Paladin the last matchup and secure a 5 4 before that. And that's like pretty tilting for Trump. That's right. And yeah, there's not really that much that, uh, that Trump can really do in these matchups. Uh, he's just uh, at the mercy of how the cards fall. The Midrange Paladin is like a really weird deck. Like the Fast Paladin has so many more good matchups than the Midrange one. The Midrange one relies on beating the Warlock, on beating the. Warrior, maybe if you get lucky and he, they play a control warrior, on beating the hunter, on beating their paladin. Mm -hmm. Matchups oh, which he man. lost. I still think it's really interesting that they chose not to bring Warlock all together because I think Warlock is just so powerful nowadays. Um, there's multiple like top tier decks that Warlock can represent, which you still have the mulligan for completely different. Um, in fact, there's there's Maligos that's also starting to get really popular. And then Handlock is still really strong and Zoo is still good. So it's like that's even more of a headache to deal with. And yet they've opted to not bring it all together. So And it is I'm, it I'm is a complete this. guessing game too. Uh with with the the format of the tournament allowing the teams to bring different decks uh every single week. Oh look at that. That's a different deck. Force yeah, and changed. And force and swing deck. it up. So he's not predictable in this matchup. Usually you don't really afford, you cannot really afford to keep Warwind versus Zoo, but versus Marilok is like in, an insta key because of Implosion. Mm -hmm. And Marilok relies on Implosion more than Zoo does. If you keep Warwind versus Zoo and you don't have a weapon versus Zoo, you're in a, you're in a really bad spot. So let's see if Trump decides to keep the Warwind or not. Well, he's also got Acolyte of Pain too, so he recognizes their synergy there. But the weapon is really key. So he fishes really hard for it. And he gets a weapon, but he's going to be disappointed when his opponent's just life tapping for the first couple of turns here. Yeah. Uh, still, he's got that slam. He's He's got something. I don't know. I think the, the real problem in this matchup for the Grim Patron Warrior is just to have nothing at the start. And what results in is you taking a, a lot of damage early on and having to use combo pieces to catch up. Look at this. 
Forsen is going try hard mode. Oh, is he actually going to coin? I th I'm thinking he's just bluffing the coin to try to make Trump think like maybe he has like an awkward curve. Mm. And it's like Forsen using Trump oh, tactics against Trump. <laughs> I that sense a little level. try hard from Forsen right now. Bluff I coin. I sense a little try hard. What are you doing, Dad? <laughs> Used to be so carefree. Now, see, it, you know what it is? The bench, the bench awoken Forsen. His latent powers and his rage has built up, and now he's achieved the next level. No more games. Okay. All right. Well, uh, Trump seems a little puzzled here. Um, do you ever just want to, like, frothing? Just whatever. No. In this matchup, you need to keep frothing to win because... If you manage to full cycle and get your burst, you just win this matchup so easily. The Modilog doesn't have that many towns. It's a really good matchup for Green Patron. But the way Forsen drew this uh, early game and the way Trump drew, I think I would say Forsen is favored to win this one. Forsen is really favored to win unless um because you ha you can't even really deal with two Azure Drakes or Twilight Drake. They keep making this mistake. Followed up by big tempo plays of the Blackwing Corruptor. Those are just very problematic. I actually like this play from Tom, because Forsen is forced to trade, and then he can use the War Axe to clear the Drake, and then he can just draw into the Execute. And after Forsen uses double Twilight Drake, he's not going to have another Dragon to activate the Blackwing. So, uh, this is going to be hard if he doesn't draw another Drake. Yeah, it doesn't matter too much. Like, he still has a good 5 play, he still has a good 6 play. What do you think of Darbom Tap? You know that your opponent is going to kill your Drake if you just trade. Do you want to donate him the free Twilight Drake and play another fresh one? Or do you want to get value from the Blackwing next turn? Like, I would see a Dark Bomb tap just so you can play Blackwing the following turn. Isn't yeah, Dark Bomb, like, much more valuable than a regular Dark Bomb when you know you're going to Tharson on 6? Yeah, but I think um, the I think I agree a lot with RDU says because you want to get Blackwing Corruptor out as like a threat. From, you also saw that you didn't he didn't have execute, so he can't deal with your second Drake. So if you can slam that onto the board effectively and know that he, um, he can't deal with it, you're going to be in a really good position. And the Dark Bomb is not really the key to victory here because you're not trying to burst the you're not like you're not going to out combo the Patron Warrior. They get there as much quicker than yours. You're, you're going to need to use board control in order to win this game. Okay, let's go with the Dark Bomb. Good call. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Forsen sees the play. And he also trades to play around uh, Trump having Battle Rage value. That's again really really good from Forsen. He's definitely yep. in try hard mode. Oh, that's right. <laughs> he turned off the music. <laughs> the plug DJ. You just have to take a hoodie off and then be, you'd be at this final form, right? Put on like a shirt. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, the Forsen boy jersey. Well, uh, looks like Trump's just got a really slow hand, though. I mean, he's going to really need to get some good card draw soon. Belcher is really good right now, because you saw the slam being played, so he needs a second slam to deal with the Belcher, and even if he deals with the Belcher, he has to deal with the slime, and the Emperor next thing is going to be huge. Also, I don't know if Trump knows this is Maligo's handlock yet. It's still looking like it could be just regular handlock. All he's seen is three cards, a Dark Bomb, That's a true. Twilight Drake, and a, a Sludge Belcher. So he might even mismanage his resource use in anticipation for Giants. Like, uh, that could be what he's anticipating in the coming turns. Mm -hmm. That's one of the reasons why Malilok was good in the first place and people started playing it. It's like a way better deck if, you don't know, if your opponent doesn't know what he plays against. It's like the Echo Giants mage deck. But... Uh, it's, it has seen a lot less play recently because people learned how to play against it. I, th I think it's seen quite a few play in recent tournaments though and the results have been pretty good. Uh, so I'm not too surprised to see Forsen bring up the deck. It's just, it feels like a deck that needs a little bit of practice that's not exactly like Handlock. And uh, I don't know, like has, has Forsen actually played this deck in a tournament setting before? Uh, I don't remember him playing it, and I don't think he even played it on stream, so that's like a big surprise from Forsen. And it's a good surprise, because as we saw, Brian Kibler knew he's, Forsen is going to play Freeze Mage, and uh, this should tell people that Forsen is not that predictable as they think he is. Mm -hmm. Man, this is such a good Hellfire. Um, 
Yeah, you is there an remove. alternative though? Do you like have to Hellfire? Sometimes you, you feel like you can remove it. So many possibilities. Yeah, because you yeah. can't like Blackwing Corruptor and then Dark Bomb to control the board. If he if he could do that and then yes. leave like a five one patron, it would have been okay. It's next mana crystal. Yeah. You can't afford to, le to leave him any patron with more than one health because you have Belcher and he can potentially farm your Belcher for more patrons. Mm -hmm. So yeah, Hellfar is like a forced play here. And from still doesn't know if Forsen is playing Handlock or Malilock. <laughs> Yeah, that's really annoying. And the worst part is that Trump also invested onto the board, and he was hoping that maybe patrons can stick, and he can get battle rage off. But this battle rage is just sitting here, um, really is nothing. Just a one card draw at the moment. It would have been a good battle rage if Forsen would have went face instead of trading the armor smith. He would have run two cards. Yeah. So one small trade making the difference between Trump having a really bad hand or him having an insane hand. Yep, yep, absolutely agree. Well, right now it looks extremely one-sided. Um, and again, Emperor Tarson uh, does see a lot of play in handlock, so still. Yeah. But at this stage, it doesn't even matter. Like, if you're Trump, you're losing versus both variations. This is right. the reason why some people decided to cut the fire, the second Fiery War Axe. I think Sixo is the first one that started it, and then a lot, a lot of professional players did, that, did the same thing. They cut Fiery War Axe and Red Corsair for more card draw to not losing yeah. these kind of situations. You overall get like more percentages. <clears throat> yeah, the... Uh, uh, sorry about that. Dropped my bag of Doritos. Um, I, I think the second Fiery War Axe was really clunky against a lot of those mid-range decks too. Um, and the cycle was super important, like you said. People were... You know, people actually experiment with different kinds of patrons, right? Like a Tempo Patron and then the, the Cycle Patron. And the Tempo Patron eventually won over the metagame because it climbed ladder really effectively. But the cycle one was still really powerful too, and I think nowadays you really want to get that cycle out because people are playing so well against the tempo versions, so they know how to stop you every single time. I know that Zalei is currently number one in A with uh, cutting the second fire wires and Red Corsair for double shield block, which yeah. is like a really smart move. Yeah, we actually saw him play that in, um, in the HTC tournament. Yeah, it's a really interesting deck. You run shield block without shield slam, but you gain enough cycle to not be How dead much in this kind of spots. Uh, it's I'm probably fine. lethal if you don't get unlucky. Oh. 18, 18, 19. Five, five, no, four, no. 14 plus it. 6. No. Yeah, it's not enough. Well, who needs to Ooh. talk? Creative plays. By the way, Acidic Swampoos, shout out to the, the weapon removals. I definitely can get behind that for sure. There it goes. Man, that is a really cheap hand. He could play yeah. almost that entire hand next turn. Yeah, he, he could do uh, double block and corruptor, um, well dark bomb, and double soul fire and, with spell damage. Yeah. Look at that. The series is tied up, wow. and Captain Forsen to the rescue evens up the series. Yeah. Meanwhile, Mayor Trump. Is floundering a little bit. Mm -hmm. He's zero four well. today. Uh, well, Forsen's record is close to that in losses, right? I think Forsen's lost like two or three. I uh, think three. He, yeah, he's two and two today. He lost two games and then got okay. benched. Then he thought long and hard about some of his mistakes. Came back. Okay. Started yeah, try yeah. harding and then won two in a row. That's what happens. Yeah, he got like assassinated by Kibler. And then came back and took it all up against Trump. It's true. Okay. It's true. Well, Trump has still yet to win a game. Uh, he still has to beat Oskaka's Rogue and Chalky's Hunter. Uh, we haven't seen much from Chalky yet, but he was able to uh, take his Paladin, uh, take a win on his Paladin against Trump's Paladin uh, in one of the earlier matches. Yeah, I don't yeah. see Trump in such a good spot. That Paladin deck, man. Well, at least okay. the Paladin deck can't lose six games. It only can lose five games maximum. <laughs> um, yeah. Th but there's, I, there's a silver lining to that cloud. I think at this stage, because there's a real risk of your team losing, um, you kind of want some points on the board, too. So I think that may actually lock in Trump to play Warrior. 
plus Warrior seems like it's pretty decent against both the the remaining decks. Yeah, this this is where I think um, having good teammates is really important so that they can you know ground you a little bit. If it's like Trump's losing and then he just keeps queuing up and. You know, Kibler went to go have nice mimosas at, at lunchtime with his dog, uh, Shiro, and then dog went back to medical school like a, you know, like a proper young adult. Then it's like, well, you know, Trump's kind of out there on the loan in his own desert island. But I have to imagine that Kibler and dog are also helping give some Trump some coaching tips in the corner. You know, let him, you know, put it on some of that water on his head, just trying to let him cool down a little bit. Yeah. In the uh, in the Archon team league here. Um, these are the, the two kind of makeshift teams, so uh, you might expect that there is some, you know, less than perfect team dynamic with, uh, how, you know, how decisions are made and maybe with how, um, you know, losses are reacted upon. So you can't, you can't be, like, too optimistic in this case, but I hope things are going okay on that end. Yeah, I, I have to imagine it will be. I mean... We've all had our, our bad streaks in Hearthstone, but it can continue. If Trump can't take down Chalky's Hunter here, then Forsen Boys, despite being down early, will be on match point. How about that? Mm. It's going to be Trump on Warrior, Chalky on Hunter. Uh, again, most of these matchups are okay. They're like pretty close to 50-50 or favorite, I think, for uh, a Grim Patron Warrior, regardless of what Hunter this really is. I know that mid-range Hunter has been giving patrons some fits. I'm curious to see what you have to say, RDU, because I know players flip-flop depends on what they favor in types of their decks. Um, do you like like a mid-range against Hunter against Patron Warrior at all? Or do you think it's even or the other way? Uh, I think mid-range Hunter is slightly favored versus Patron. On the other hand, Face Hunter is really bad versus Patron because Patron just needs one or two Whirlwind Effects and one Armor Smith or a Shield Block and they just win. But Midrange Hunter can just curve out perfectly into Savannah and mm -hmm. Patron has a really hard time dealing with Savannah High Main. I played both Midrange Hunter and Patron a lot and I can say if the Hunter gets Savannah on an empty board, it's pretty much game over. Okay. That's not Snake Chucky style, though. He's got that Worgen Infiltrator. Wait, wait. <laughs> Snake Trap? Hmm. It's a pretty That's cool really idea. Because you attack with Worgen and they have to deal with it. And if they deal with it, bam, snakes. Mm hmm. Yeah, Hearthstone is almost always better that you have three 1 1s than a 3 3 creature. Just usually against mm -hmm. Warrior, that's the exception. So now, like, Trump doesn't know what secret to play against. He expects explosive from the face hunter, but he should also think of the snake trap possibility. Yeah, I don't think it changes too much of his game plan. If he finds out it's snake trap ever, he's still in a really good spot because he has the death spy like soon. If he we predicts snake trap, turn, if he predicts it, he can trade and then whirlwind the whole board. That'll be insane. Let's see if the mayor of Valotown sees this play. I don't know if you would predict it versus I think it's just common to try and trade for a 2-1 if you have a 1-3 on the board. Uh, most likely try to take out the Iron Beak Owl to avoid Beast Synergy. And then it just happens to be that it's Snake Trap and he's just going to Whirlwind from that point. I think, like he's, I think he's just going to Whirlwind and he's going to attack with a Ghoul Realize. It's like nothing and then maybe even coin the uh, Argent Commander. Like you don't need to combo in this in this game to win. Argent. Oh, you mean the. A oh, Warsong Commander, sorry. The Warsong Commander? Yeah. Gotcha. Playing a Temple Warsong. Yeah, playing Temple Warsong is pretty nice in this matchup. It forces your opponent to use free damage to deal with it, or else they just lose. He values Battle Rage over Armor Up, which I can see. Yeah, I, I like this sequence a lot. This is very nice for him to keep up the card count. Hunter's already struggling for damage now. Um, yeah, but wow. like the, the Grim Patron Warrior outside of Armorsmith doesn't really have any life gain at all. Well, it's, it's got the hero power. The hero power yeah. helps. Light, you know, and that, that's still, you know, every little bit helps in this case. Or if you play Shield Block. That is I true. I don't think I, it's I, here in this one, though. Yeah. No, it's not in Trump's deck. Jackie can still like empty his hand next turn if he gets a uh, one or two mana card 
and draw the card with quick shot, apply pressure. Lotep is pretty good on curve. What if he top decks Savannah? That would be nice. Oh yeah, we don't actually know truly what type of hunter it is. Um because I don't think face hunters even commonly play Lotheb, right? Yeah, some of them uh, do. Some some do. I know that um, you know, a few people were really experimenting with it, like Back when uh, in Gfinity, I know Reyna was actually trying to test it out as a way to kill Freeze Mage as Face Hunter, because people considered Freeze Mage to be a bad matchup for Face Hunter, generally speaking. Um, and so that was like a case he replaced Leroy with it. But now it could be more of that hybridish approach because he's got weird stuff like Snake Trap as well. I, I think you go for the Hero Power and keep the Quick Shot for the next turn. Yeah, I you want even... to maximize damage. I don't even know if it's worth it to um, Mad Scientist because there's a good chance it'll just stay alive. And I think if you're playing Worgen, you're probably playing Chargers. So I think the um, Abusive Sergeant is probably getting more value not being played. I'll show them all. Hmm, six mana, seven mana available to Trump with the coin. Not really looking at an opportunity to lethal in the next two turns, right? I mean, he does have two whirlwind effects and a frog and berserker plus war song. Um, Med scientist complicates things a lot. It's so hard oh, yeah, to play around, the, around all these things. Um, I don't see Trump in a good spot. He needs to draw into armor smith soon, and if he gets armor smith, he can use. The Warsong Commander with maybe Frauding Berserker and some Warwings to clear the board and at the same time get some armor for himself. What about uh, Warsong Coin, no Mission Inventor to kill the uh, Mad Scientist? Um, that means he will not be able to hero power. It's one of the good plays, probably maybe better than playing Frauding, because you get closer to the armor smith. But this play is more aggressive. Yeah, this is uh, a play to try to kill your opponent. And he's yeah. really hoping that this is like maybe explosive trap so he can uh, get that bounce back. Correct. Oh, oh, Trump is so surprised. The freezing trap out of nowhere. Uh oh. At least it's not misdirection. Oh. That would be even worse. <laughs> oh, yes. You are absolutely <laughs> correct, aren't you? <laughs> I mean, it could have been easily the misdirection. He would have lost the game. It's still a pretty bad spot to be in for Trump. Oh yeah. my goodness. If you would wow. have expected that, Creep's play was better because you set up for proccing the freezing trap with Nomish. Now Chuck is gonna draw and push. Seven damage. Yep, doesn't even but, care. But now not playing abusive last turn, he misses two damage. Okay, you gotta kill the well, charger anyway. Yusuf would have died in the whirlwind, right? Yeah, but you still get the two damage out. Oh, and now, okay, okay. actually, now if he survives, he gets three damage. If he survives, so he had to wait the chance of abusive surviving with the instantly two damage. That's what Hearthstone is about at this uh, level of play. Mhm. Mm yeah, we don't mess around. <laughs> this is Hearthstone. Uh acolyte. Such a defensive play here, slamming on it, or whirlwinding, I don't even know. I feel like um, I might like the frothing play a little better, just frothing whirlwind armor. Yeah, you wanna push damage, at the same time armor up. Whoa, is that lethal? Potentially. Um, let's see, he's got 9, if this jungle lands, if it, it hits, is 9. 50-50! We all love 50 50. This is Hearthstone! No, it's no. Not Hearthstone. Never lucky. Yeah. We're not Hearthstone yet, but that, that was very close. Alright, well, can, can Trump actually win here with a ridiculous uh, frothing? It's gonna have to be a cheaper one, because that 5 mana one is no um, way gonna cut it. I feel like if he draws Armor Smith, he still can stabilize, right? He's got two executes and song stuff, so he can. It okay. feels like he can. Mm -hmm. It's a small chance because Chucky drawing bow, Chucky drawing any charger instantly wins. Yeah, that's true. 
And that's like after oh, he lost oh, the fist. Oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. That's a whoa. sick draw. He can he can charge, play the ghoul and the armor smith. Oh. He should charge the armor smith too, right? Yeah. Armor smith can also take some damage. Although the priority is to wait, keep armor smith alive, right? What happened? I think Oh he wait. He's not playing. He's going to use his executes instead. Okay. He's going to play executes and then play the unstable ghoul, so that way the knife juggler or whatever crashes in has to give him more armor. That opens yeah, him up to... Yeah, oh. To spell. oh my god, that's crazy, the second armor smith. How is he killing that though? But just playing a stable ghoul and armoring up is really bad against Owl. He insta loses to Owl too. Did he forget to armor up? Oh no, never mind. So, uh, Owl is insta win. Oh, oh that. that's insta win. Yeah, that's insta win. Was the other play enough armor? I feel like it may have been. Charging, playing the war song, the ghoul, and the one armor smith. Oh, that would have been tougher for sure. Never mind. Chalky sends his love from Indiana to California. Trump has lost five in a row. That's a really bad spot to be. Wow. Especially for the next oh, weeks. It's gonna be tilting for the next weeks because he knows that even if his teammates win, he still has to get the wins. Well, it's not it's not over, RDU. I mean, Trump can still take home the victory, but mm -hmm. now this is where you start getting a little nervous because you know they were up a pretty good lead, you know, four two, and then feeling pretty good. Was it four two, or was it, it was a four was it more than that? I think it was. It was four one. It was definitely at least one one win. It wasn't like four zero. Oh. Right. Right. Jackie got the win four. fast. It was 1-1, one, one, it was 1-0, oh, and then 1-1, one, one, and then 4-1, one, one, and now it's 4-5. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. That's um, right, that's right. I would say that the Warrior is slightly favored versus Rogue, if you play it perfectly. And I think Trump uh, will play it perfectly. And the Paladin is like really bad. Like, Paladin versus Rogue is like worse than Paladin versus Freeze Mage. So it's like less than one digit. No, I don't think so. <laughs> you don't think so? I mean, I play a lot of joke paladin decks, uh, so I have some experience with with this. Crip, you are literally every Reddit comment out there right now. <laughs> yeah, I, I've I've dipped casually into rank seventeen. Let me tell you, paladin is great. It's like, yeah. all right, man. Yeah, you know, I feel like uh, no. Okay, I, I think it's a bad matchup, but I think it's better than against Freeze Mage. Uh, like yeah, against, I, I can definitely identify with that. Like, against like, Rogue, um, you just like, they just don't have enough damage if you keep healing and keep laying down taunts. Well, I think it's the tempo that you can often get. And Rogue, um, uh, it's like, you need the specific uh, removal. Like, yeah. like, Rogue without coin against Paladin that has coin and curves well is like really problematic because then you don't get the benefit off of really subtle things like. SI7 agents and being able to combo well and get like bio teacher stuff. So, mm -hmm. yeah. They can still have Fan of Knives on your master and insta win. Well, not really insta win, but. Well, like get like a huge advantage. Yeah. One of the ways Paladins wins versus Rogue is like, again, as usual, Rogue just doesn't get sprinted at the right time and they run out of cards and then Paladin just outvalues them with True Silver on the free freeze, like first year and SI and then just removing their whole boards with Equality Consecrations. I would see Paladin being in a good spot if he manages to be in a good spot after getting double sapped on his taunters. But first of all, we have another matchup. We have yeah, Warrior have versus warrior. Rogue. In which you, you hard mulligan for weapons, you try to cycle, clear their board, apply pressure while clearing their board, and then set up for a frotting little. I, I think that this matchup is like highly favored for Patreon. If both players played correctly. Mm hmm. Um, well, I, I like the hand Oskaka has. It's just like very varied. He can uh, deal with some of that early game garbage. He has some draw, he has a weapon. Um, I think Trump's hand um, is really kind of all over the place right now. You full mulligan that, but there is one interesting thing Oskaka runs Harrison Jones, which is like really good versus Warrior if you get it on curve. Mm hmm. Yeah, that's true. Forget, uh, don't forget about Harrison Jones being a potential factor. Oskaka also plays Van Cleef, and I've seen him being rotated out in a lot of people's um, oil rogue decks. Maybe it's just for the latter thing, but 
I, I actually like Van Cleef still in the decks. It helps you really race if you need to, especially against super aggressive decks like, you know, I've seen people use it against Hunter very effectively. So, um, you know, what, what do you think about Van Cleef in a rogue deck, RDU? I think it's really situational. Like, if everybody's playing Hunter, of course you play Van Cleef. Even though he's bad versus Howl, it can help you race. But in a meta with Warriors, he gets executed, and that's not really what you want. Uh, in the Van Cleef spot, you can usually play Hillbot or the second teacher or uh, another big threat. At the same time, you can play Deckhand for more damage. So it's like, according on how you want to build your rogue, you can build it in many ways. Alright. Um, is there a play here that doesn't involve backstab and a hero power? Sap? <laughs> uh, I don't think you sap that. No. That's okay, you have two backstabs. Um, it's a card for a card, and you're left with the weapon. There's worse things out there. And you need to deal with that with Stable Ghoul early on because of things like what you said, the Acolyte behind it and making it complicated to deal with and drawing too many cards. Inner Rage is really good here. It's really hard for Rogue to deal two damage in one go. I actually think this might get sapped. I think... Oh, can you sap? No, you can't. I was thinking you could, uh, you could sap coin out the, uh, the Van Cleef. No, unfortunately you can't. You can coin out your hero power, though, if you feel, feel frisky, but I think you better save that for the Azure Drake. Mm -hmm. And that works out great. Coin Azure Drake, backstab for three damage and kill off the, the Nobish Inventor. Yeah, pretty good curve. Here you a, can yeah, coin Drake. You can coin Drake and backstab and uh, use the dagger yeah. to uh, kill the Gnomish. I mean, with, with then, two Drakes and the coin, it's just a clear play here. Drake is really bad against uh, Death's Bite. Yeah. Oh, well. What if you draw Harrison in the next two cards? That would be nice. Yeah. Well, Skaka is taking his time, thinking yeah, of all the mean... options. Oh, oh you guys are sigh. sigh. So this that is means, a weapon test. It probably just values the coin more. That means he's gonna go Drake into coin sprint, probably. He wants to uh, be sure he gets that draw. He wants the Blade Flurry because Trump can just go YOLO at any time. So he needs the Blade Flurry. Mm -hmm. And he <laughs> also wants to get rid of the user sprint as soon as possible. Because if you play it too late in the game, they can just kill you. What now? I like that. Being a Skaka, you don't really have a play. You probably just donate him the Acolyte of Pain and Hero Power. Let the pain speak to me. Yep. That's what's going on. Uh, Warrior's playing the draw game. Rogue's playing the draw game. <laughs> Who draws the most powerful combo is probably going to win. Oh. And he would have drawn oh, Harrison. Oh, the Harrison he... Jones. Yeah. Mm. Harrison is really good when you draw him, when you need to. Well, uh, assuming there's a weapon on the other side to even benefit off of. Well, the thing is, I think the warrior kind of kind of needs a weapon for his combo. So you the, just cr you just create that extra speed bump. The problem with running Harrison in Rogue is that you make matchups like Druid or Warlock, which are really good. Like you make them pretty bad. And I'm not sure if you want that, but in this format where you know your opponent is going to play weapon classes, it might be a good idea. Is it really determined by that one card, Harrison Jones, as opposed to, like, uh, I don't know if you're playing anything else like uh, Sludge Belcher or Lothabra, etc. Does it really make those matchups, like, unfavorable all of a sudden, because you have Harrison? Again, it's the way you want to approach it. You can play, like, uh, Harrison or the second Healbot, as you can play, like, Van Cleef or the BGH in the free spot. It's how you want to build your rogue deck for what meta you expect. Well, Trump really struggling to come up with a turn here. He was, uh, he was kind of suggesting that he wants to play the acolyte. Um, I just don't see how that really works. Just acolyte weapon, I guess. You could trade into the Drake and then Acolyte Whirlwind, and if he wants to kill the Acolyte, he has to trade a free one, and you still draw two cards and remove the free one threat. And if he doesn't, you still have another Whirlwind for the following turn. But I think he wants to keep the Whirlwind to get a lot of damage with Frothing Berserker. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, or at least be able to draw off Battle Rage so that way he can get his War Song Commander. Because the Frothing Berserker right now is just isolated, and it's a it's a big threat, but it needs to be paired with the charging mechanism. What do you think about coin uh, oil into Van Cleef? Oh, that that is actually happening. That's exactly happening. Okay. That's the play because you put two big threats, so he yeah. needs to have double execute. Oh, this yeah. is a great play. Yeah, it's just uh, a little bit weak on uh, on the weapon. You almost always want both charges when you oil. I think the value that you get by having a big board and powerful minions on it is like okay, even if you have only one stack on your dagger. Mm -hmm. We've actually seen some Grimpatron Warriors uh, run BGH, but that's been phasing out slowly. You very rarely see that nowadays. Yeah, same with the Rogue. People used to play BGH in Rogue and you don't really see that anymore. BGH lost value because people stopped playing that much Handlock. That's one of the reasons why Malilock is not being played that much as it was during Dreamhack. Mm -hmm. Alright, well, he picks up another way to be a little bit more defensive in the Dread Corsair, but definitely needs to stop taking the pressure here. Yeah, Trump's really milking these turns, trying to think as much as he can. It's, it's a tough spot to be in because you're on the verge of getting... Uh, losing six games for your team. Yeah. Ooh, seven to your own face. Don't you think it was good to also try to draw from your Acolyte? Or you want him at the 2 HP spot to be immune to Fan of Knives? Mm. I, I don't know. I think uh, at this point, you're talking about using the Inner Rage, right? To cycle yeah. Yes. Okay, I, I I feel like so many I feel like that's really important to keep for like Grim Patron or something if you need to because I think the extra damage on the accolade or the extra draw here is not as consequent important because he's not gonna be able to deal the damage anyway. So I think it's fine. Um, that's a good sprint turn. Yeah, that's pretty good. Look at that. Trump needs the Death's Bite faster. He didn't draw it. It's pretty mm -hmm. unlucky. If he gets Death's Bite now, he can get lethal next turn. Armor Smith might, uh, might stop some more damage. The thing is that if you play Armor Smith or double Armor Smith, you're pretty weak against uh, Blade Flurry. Why do you have to take that risk? Isn't it that weak? And yeah, you gain 8 armor. If you use Inner Rage, he's actually an okay spot to okay. You might also want to battle rage maybe because you need the, arm, the weapon. I'm yeah, this sure this bite is the key to unlocking. You already have a lot of small minions, and then uh, the dread course here becomes free, and you have two whirlwind effects. Mm -hmm. Yep, that's that can be easy lethal. But probably at this stage, you have to keep in mind. Um, I mean, it's a team format. Uh, we are we are broadcasting on delay, but I'm sure the team is is. Watching what's going on, they probably know the uh, the Harrison isn't Oskaka's deck at this point. So Trump probably knows with this many cards drawn from the Rogue that uh, it is maybe even a liability to draw that much to hope for a weapon. Double mm. blade flurry is pretty nice. Oskaka is almost having lethal here if he gets. Um, Buff for the weapon next turn, he can get a lethal with preparation if he plays yeah. flurries now. Yeah, that's a good point. I like that. He's a really tough spot for Trump. Rogue has just so many cards, also. Like, sometimes Rogue just doesn't have any. That sprint was really big, like you mentioned. Alright. He's got the Grim Patron. So, what can you do this turn? Hmm. I guess maybe he's also slightly regretting not being able to draw more with that ba second battle rage just sitting there. It could armor smith, whirlwind, execute, battle rage, armor up, I don't know. Oh man. But then you give away you give away your whirlwind effect and then you don't have you don't have a weapon, so like the death bite, so you can't guarantee that even if you draw the second Falling Berserker that you'd get insane damage totals onto it. Then you can play Patron yeah. Whirlwind, get two patrons out. And the same play, draw some cards, maybe. Yeah, maybe your opponent doesn't have a way. Yeah, seems like that's what he's doing. Yep. Yeah. I must choose. 
Trump needs something really good right now. This series shows how punishing the Conquest format really is. The Conquest format usually punishes weaker decks, but in a format where you have to pick 6 out of 9 classes, you're guaranteed to have some weaker decks. Mm -hmm. So it's like, depending on the skill of the team and how they pick that weaker decks to manage to get wins on them. Yeah, but the Patient Warrior is not exactly a weak deck at all. Um, people would say that one of the first picks. Yeah, yeah that, but people would say that the Double Fire Warax uh, Warrior is kind of weaker. Most of the people just switched to one Fire Warax to be more consistent. Yeah, I agree. Um, it's definitely but the trend happening a lot. Trump also lost most of his games on Paladin. I'm sure Warrior would have won most of these if he only played Warrior. Well, if he won, if he loses this game, he actually lost three games with Paladin, lost three games with Warrior. So it's it's even. You can't really blame one or the other. Is it uh, four for the Paladin? No, he lost. Um, he lost two with the Warrior so far, and this is the third that he's trying in a row, right? Hmm. All right. Well, uh, pretty good. Harrison's going to come down, but again, we're at the stage where the Rogue is kind of running running out of threats. Yeah, but then he got Harrison to shut down the Death Spite. That's also really big. Yeah, but in a stall game, the Rogue loses. But no, nah, okay, okay, you're you're right. Generally speaking, if um if you give too much time to Patient War, that is only the first Death Spite as well. Yeah. But Harrison's also a body on the board, uh, and. If Oskaka picks up any other semblance of board presence, like any of his four drops, which he has yet to pick up, like Pilot Shredder, it's just problematic for the warrior to deal with. And he's not sitting at the most comfortable amount of life either. Now, like, like Trump is even defensive to the point where he puts the Dread Corsair down. Normally you save Dread Corsair for the moments you're going to go off with the Whirlwind effect. So you get either better battle rages or you know more damage on your Fathering Berserkers. Etc. Even more damage to the combo, but um, he's being defensive because he's worried about the uh, the rogue being able to do too much damage to him here. Uh, Emperor Tharson's pretty good, uh, but I think any turn here involves Harrison first, just to see your draw and start to activate the combo effect. Yeah, uh, the the whirlwind effect. Let's see. You could think about sapping Armorsmith to deny him the armor. Maybe you top deck on SI and you finish perfectly on curve, killing the Dread Corsair. What about sapping the Dread Corsair? So it costs 4 mana, probably. That's also an option. But then you give him more pieces for the combo if he draws a second Death's Bite. Yeah, that's okay. Wow, taking the Armorsmith very seriously. He's prepping the Eviscerate, so he expects something from the top deck. Yeah, yeah okay, hopefully just, a free drop. He's just, just playing, playing that. Uh, yeah, he's just playing that Thalnos. If nothing happens, maybe. Yep. Okay. That's the card Trump needed. Yes. Ah, uh, that's really helpful, and he can even hide that behind the uh, Dread Corsair if he wants to protect it a little bit. And it looks like he's gonna do a Grim Patron turn. Okay. He feels threatened. Reasonable. He feels threatened, so he feels the need to go for the Green Patron. But uh, Emperor might be the winning play at this point. I think that if you go Emperor now and next time you go Warsong Patron, you trade into Talnos, and then you trade a stable Ghoul, you get three more Patrons that, that can attack, you get the Whirlwind Effect for the Frotting. You're probably close to Lethal if you don't have Lethal. But it's a risky play because you can die to oil combinations. Yep. I mean, even just this Blade Flurry clears the board, and now he's presented with uh, the Pilot Shredder here. Okay. Whoa. Oh. Mm. That's a lot of well, damage. I think maybe, it would have been maybe lethal. Not. Yeah. Almost. Almost. It's yeah, too that's off. 12 damage over two turns. Yeah, I think um, that would have been crazy. He has to play Flurry. So really right. Uh, plays the heal ball just to be safe. To be safe against five cards. <laughs> oh, You're crazy. playing against Patron. Yeah. yeah. Wow. That's a pretty big draw too, I think. Yeah, I think so. 
Although Thorsten doesn't really get that much value now. It's just more of like a 5-5 five, five, um, minion on the board that can present damage every single turn. Because you're just reducing the cost. And it's like most likely you'll be able to play whatever comes out anyways next turn. Mm -hmm. Trump yeah. can still win this game. I it's not over. Surely. Rogue is, is out of gas practically at this point. Oh, no. That's that's a pretty... Uh... Actually, that's a useless draw. It's completely useless. Preparation. Uh, only if he gets sprint completely next turn. Completely useless. <laughs> if he gets sprint next turn, he'll, it actually might be very useful. Um, is but it? it's still an if. I wonder how many cards are actually left in the Rogue's deck. I don't think there's that many. That's a good draw. That's a great draw. Now you can eliminate the uh, Pilot Shredder and get it draw a card first. You want to slam after you play the Frothing Berserker so you get a little bit of damage. Yeah. Even though you waste and you want to play the Frothing after the Charger. So. Yep. Might get Some lethal. sequencing involved there. <laughs> Call back to last game. Is there any way he gets lethal? Uh, what if... No, no, not now, like before the draw. Uh -oh. Am I getting Frothing? Maybe yeah. it, it oh, what? what you, explosive sheep, maybe? <laughs> oh, explosive sheep. Dang, I didn't even think about that. I think Trump wins this game. Yeah, there's still a chance if there's a viscerate beam. Oh, no, no, he's one damage off, right? He used both eviscerates. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, he used not to kill the armor smith. He needs sprint. He needs multiple cards sprint. here. That's not it. No. No, he's dead. Oh, That's good. Wow. There it is. Trump gets a Trump point. Gets there you go. Now we are on match point. In this uh, best of 11, both teams are on five points, waiting to get their sixth. Uh, both Trump and Oskaka uh, really trying to claim that second point that uh, has been uh, quite... Actually, Trump's first point has been very evasive. I think yep. the key turn was when Oskaka played a Hillbot over playing Shredder at 23 HP. When we said that he was afraid, maybe playing Shredder... Trump would have been forced to still trade with it, and then he can uh, play the oil on the Shredder and maybe even oh. lethal him on spot. That's so that play point. might have mattered, actually. Yeah, I mean, that's that's actually what we were talking about, too, when we were discussing plays. I really thought the Shredder was a stronger play on the board, but you were saying that he was playing really afraid with five cards in the hand, and it happened to be that Frothing Berserker and uh, the War Song yeah. were ready to go. I haven't seen Trump actually um, even draw Gromash. I wonder if he had that as a potential way to pressure too um, in the, the coming closes of the game. But that, there's been so many games we've seen the Warrior, I don't know if he has it. Hmm. Let's see how good the Paladin versus Rogue is. Yeah, you guys were saying how uh, it might be worse than against Freeze Mage. I certainly don't think so. Um, given my, my terrible attempts at Paladin against basically a net deck Rogue, which is uh, probably a, a rough idea of this matchup. I yeah. think you'd 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 probably lose two out of three. I think that's my guess. Okay, well, I it's still think... pretty bad. We can agree on that. I don't think we have to necessarily compare it to like how awful it is, but it's still mm -hmm. a really big struggle either yeah. way for Pal. Quite a struggle. You can win by pushing a lot of damage early on with like a perfect curve with Master for Battle being unanswered yeah. by Fan of Knives, or you can win by stalling them down. But I still think Rogue is like 65-70% favorite versus Paladin. We'll see. Another way you win is like Rogue using Saps on uh, Shredders, and then you just play Tyrion and they don't have any answer for Tyrion. Yeah. There are many ways this matchup can go. We'll see. It's a really interesting series though. It's like 5-5, five, five, really exciting. Like nobody wants to lose it for the win. It's like such an important game. So much pressure going on. Mm-hmm. When I played my game at 5-5, five, five, it was probably like the first time in competitive play when I was actually Afraid to lose, I was like sweating. It was like awful. It ended up good though. Now, uh, Oskaka was the one who was uh, holding back uh, the last few points in uh, in Forsen's Bo Forsen Boys' first showing in, uh, in the team league. Uh, you think maybe he has some added pressure from that? Maybe not feeling the confidence? It's one week from there, but uh, maybe. May there is, of course, some pressure on Oskaka. I think he would have played the Pality Shredder over Hillbot if there was like no pressure on him. Mm -hmm. We see Trump counting some outs of Mulligan. And that's something really interesting because most of the, pe most of the people just do the Mulligan instantly, whereas Trump likes to take his time to gain every single 
point of percentage in his win rate, which is really nice. Yeah, um, Juice Over Champion, though, is really effective against uh, Rogue, generally speaking. But I think the early game curve is also uh, really valuable as well. Oh my god. Double prep with nothing. Wow. This is probably the most free hand you'll ever get in terms of um, cheapest spells or cheapest things in Rogue's deck. Trump's hand is actually really good. You like Aldor's in this matchup a lot. I would actually even keep Aldor. Mm -hmm. I would keep True Silver if I was on the coin, so I like Trump's decision of mulliganing True Silver away. True Silver is really good versus Azai Drakes, of course, versus Assize, versus Farseers, but it's really bad versus Teachers. It's decent versus Shredders. Versus Shredders, you want Aldor's as like the best one. Have we seen a single Violet Teacher from this rogue deck? Uh, not no, yet. I don't believe so. Violet Teachers in general have been a liability. Um, so, yeah, they're not as valued. And coincidentally enough, it makes them, um, you know, a little bit worse against things like Paladin, which you can have the 1-1s one match up against Paladin. Even though they do get cleared eventually by things like Consecration, you can help fight back on the board a lot more effectively. Do you like the Tempo Aldor there, guys? Yeah. Uh, the, the, the thing about the Tempo Aldor is that if your opponent doesn't have a threat, then you can continue to curve out pretty well. Um, so I like it only in the context of that Oskaka doesn't have an immediate response on the board. He could have played Knife Juggler. Like, the worst thing that can happen when you play Juggler is your opponent playing a uh, Backstab or a Psy. And if he plays Backstab plus a Free Drop, you have the Aldor for his Free Drop. If he plays an Psy combination, you have Aldor for his Psy. Whereas, if you play Aldor on Curve, you lose the Aldor effect, but you gain the potential of going uh, juggler on curve with either hero power or the second juggler. So again, now they have to like value to see if uh, it's better to curve out perfectly or just play off curve but get more value on spot. What do you think about juggler and then the dude versus juggler juggler? Juggler Is juggler it? sucks versus backstab SI. Yeah, but don't you think backstab had like a decent chance of being played on the Alder last turn. Hmm. It probably had. Yeah, like definitely really considering that ball. he had the weapon charge up still. It could also be like a bluff from Oskaga to force Trump into playing uh, Knife Juggler. The thing is that if you have one backstab and one SI, you usually want to keep the combo for when you play both. And it's not really worth it to backstab SI and Aldor. So he probably just played Farseer to bait out yeah. some more stuff for backstab yeah. SI. So maybe Trump thought of that and uh, decided to go for the alternate route. All right. Well, Trump's got his own Harrison, which is uh, going to come in handy in this matchup. Getting a little bit better and better here. First, Oskaka having the terrible draws. Uh, Trump having some decent draws and getting the Harrison. Which back to I think, back Harrison. Yeah, mm. but I, I feel like it's much more relevant if the Paladin has it. Like you know, it's it's a, it's a bonus if the rogue has it against the paladin, but it's a bigger <laughs> bonus if the paladin has it against the rogue, don't you think? Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, if you can shut down the blade flurry, that's just so big. So, generally speaking, you're correct, although I wouldn't underestimate um, you know, the power of being able to take away a, pal uh, a paladin's true silver champion or drawing an insane amount of cards if uh, you somehow get their Ashbringer or something. Also, the way rogues usually play with the blade versus paladin is they use the first stack to kill one monster and then the second one to blade flurry unless there's like a big enough board to be worth to instant blade flurry we see Trump not playing the shredder in the middle let's see if he gets punished for that yeah no, that's the one thing that's uh, about technical play did um, we also see the shredder played before attacking in? I, I missed that for just a second um, yeah the shredder was know, played before uh, yeah, yeah he, he he played the sh he played everything and then attacked him. So. Oh, so he tried to go for the double juggle, the one and four. I think um, the best way to go for that is like you you test the first juggler, and if it hits, you can go for the second one. Mm -hmm. That's like w the way to abuse the RNG. Yeah, I like slap sap on the shredder because you have an, a second sap for some bigger threats. But uh, again, we go into this spot where if he uses double sap too early, he might just have no answer for Tyrion. Tyrion being at 6 HP is a really rough spot for the rogue. 
it's so hard for rogues to deal with Tyrion. The Divine Shield plus 6 HP is just destroying them. But, well, of course, they have Sap. So one Sap has to be for Tyrion, usually. Mm -hmm. Alright, well, the Juggler goes down to the SI. Uh, Trump's still in, uh, in good shape right now. And there isn't that much in hand of Oskaka, even after the sprint. We still got like Ash Belcher? Drake and Harrison for draws, and Thalnos, so he's still got ways to refill the hand. Yeah, but he doesn't have like any real substance right now. He's just mm -hmm. like still playing the whatever cards I got, they go down type of game. And I mean, that's that's the game the Paladin plays all throughout, but usually the Rogue has uh, uh, more to benefit from card, card synergy and combos. Yeah, fair enough. Uh, Slush Belcher is normally pretty annoying to deal with, but in this case, it's also Eviscerate managed to clear it off. Looks like a pretty clean Azure Drake Eviscerate. Do you also backstab? So, um, you kill the one to slime? Hmm... Maybe with a spell damage in hand. As well as maybe the Azure surviving, keeping the backstab has a decent amount of value. Sap? No sap. Okay. I really don't like using Sap here. If he drops Tyrion right afterwards, does playing he have a way to respond it? Playing Sap versus. Oh, no, no. I think he doesn't. He, he maybe wants his opponent to play Tyrion, because if he can deal with it, like with the six mana or the six damage eviscerate on the uh, Blood Mage Thanos and Azure Drake, he can Harrison too, right? Oh, that's really smart, actually. Yeah. So like he backs, like he backs down Mister Tyrion, and then <laughs> Harrison's the Ashbringer. I don't think he has mana to do all that. No, because he has to. He has to uh, play the um, Thalnos. Yeah, he has to play the Thalnos, then uh, do the Abyssray play, then Harrison. So okay, he's one right. mana off, and one mana with like a Tyrion on the board, mm. and you not be able to answer it might just be like a bit too much. Okay. Maybe I'm just reading too much into things then. <laughs> no, but that that, that is the, the last idea, girl I told the crip. Is that what you're telling me? No, it, it seems. I... Oh, okay. It, it seems like a good idea um, to use sap when it's favorable if you have an answer for Tyrion, and he does. So I think in in general, it's, it's good. It's certainly interesting. Trump d doesn't really like playing Shredder in the middle. I was about to say, man. <laughs> Ever since you started pointing it out already, I can't not see it anymore. <laughs> so it's like, ugh. Because it's like, I, I started, because people did it so often nowadays that I've forgotten to really point it out. Oh, look at that! <laughs> look at that! It doesn't really what? truly matter because it's cleared, but. Yeah. Once you miss little ones, which happened to me, you'll always play it in the middle. Oh, you miss lethal by not having it in the center? Yeah, I got flame on. Not in oh. the tournament, just on ladder. <laughs> Yeah. Mech Shaman, I take it. <laughs> well, Skaka just refuses to keep the dagger, which is like playing around Harrison, a card you know Paladin is having, and he may look at how many cards he Trump was keeping, and he saw that some cards were kept for a long time. Mm -hmm. Trump also knows that uh, Oskaka doesn't have any more saps, so he can play the towns without caring. Hmm. That's quite a bit of damage, but Trump still has a lot of life left. And um, the thing is, like, with the rogue here, if you can't push for, like, a really dangerous situation, I don't know if you could actually just dump these cards for face damage, because you have nothing, nothing left afterwards. I think uh, you, if it's, like, almost... You have to go for it though, because your hand is really aggressive. This is uh, six, ten. If it lands on the Drake, that's massive damage. Actually, it doesn't really matter. It's massive damage either way. You can manipulate it so that the Salsi Dick hand guarantees takes it out. Uh, there's gonna, not going to be a Salsi Dick hand this turn, is there? Oh, he's even going one step further. He's um, trying to bait out Harrison before it, right? Oh man, he really wants Harrison to come down from Trump. I really like the way Oskaka's playing this this match. Hmm. Yeah, he's Did waiting it... out all the stuff from Trump. 
Did we see the Harrison and Trump stack up until this game, though? Uh, yeah, we I have, believe we have. so, yeah. Okay. And like 90-something percent of the Paladin run uh, Harrison mm. because you can afford to. Yeah. It, uh, Harrison here, though, um, it actually draws you one card, and with that one card, you really want it to be like true silver champion. Trump decides to go instead for lay on hands. Oh, I like equality here. I don't think you use it now. You might want to be greedy, right? No. I think it's good enough to use now. Trump wants to be can, greedy. You can be a little bit greedy and still set up um, a reasonable board afterwards with muster, right? Oh, wow. Okay, that's a bit of damage. Uh... 8, 11 exists on board, plus 2. It's, plus, it's 13 in hand. 6. Okay, 13 it's in hand, plus 11 on board, so that's not lethal. Yeah. And the thing is that if Trump manages to stabilize, and I would definitely see him doing that, Osaka is in a really bad spot unless he draws Sprint. Mm. If he plays Muster for battle, he might just Harrison that and draw more cards. Yeah. What if he just goes for like equality consecration into hero power and then next turn he draws Tyrion? He just wins oh. because Oskaka has no answer for that. That'd be a pretty epic way for uh, Trump to climb back. Like he's down losing five games in a row and just wins the next two. He will prove he's the true mayor of Value Town. Well, Oskaka okay. might go for a really greedy play. Too. I think he's just going to set up for a two turn lethal. Uh oh. This is gonna get Harrison, right? It is gonna get Harrison, but I think the idea is that if you get Harrison, you can't get like your board messed with too hard. Yeah, you can't equality consecrate you after Harrison. Yeah. Mm. So I like it. Oh, he doesn't even attack the weapon. Can't. He attacked already in the zombie chow. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Just poison. kidding. <laughs> False alarm. <laughs> False You're alarm. just testing I was us, testing right? You guys and you guys pass. Congrats. All right. <laughs> Um, okay, well, I think I think this is equality, consecrate, and maybe kings on the dude. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a way to clear everything. Usually, you would go like equality, trade, consecrate, but because you want to kings the dude, you go equality, consecrate, kings. You just don't have a better four mana play. And next time you can have like Harrison into Sludge. Which is super good. And this way you don't play weapons into his Harrison, which you know he has. Trump is roping this out. Let's see if the animation helps him. Oh. Wow, you're hmm. being really greedy here. Yeah. He's shutting down the weapon now so he can gain life there. He has a uh, hell uh, this is This is, this is gonna cost him. Four, eight. He forgot he about needs a little bit more damage. Yeah, but he might get it about here. That. Oh. oh! There you That's go. It. That's it. Wow. And uh, Forsen boys will take it. Oh my goodness. Is he going to drop the Harrison as well? That's, That's brutal. No! Oh man. Oskaka realizing that. And that was, Blade uh, Flurry. Sense. Poor Trump. Yeah, Trump. Trump bites it here. Well, uh, only one of them could win and close it out for their team, but Forsen boys. Gets their second win. That was really close call, though. Trump uh, almost yeah. was able to, to take it home, but unfortunately was not able to. Well, I, yeah, with, with a few different plays, I think he, he would have won that game. But um, it's, it's really close plays. It's really hard to judge which one is going to have the best result. Uh, it just it sucks to pick wrong and then know you would have won if you did anything else. That's all. <sighs> oh well, uh, the Paladin uh, ends up dropping four games here and ends up Wait. being the LVP. Wait. Trump didn't win. Trump ends up dropping four games with the Paladin, right? Yeah, but we're looking at uh, oh, the graph where Value Town won. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I thought you it, it rigged wrong, so. R riots. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Yeah. We, need, we need to create more drama and controversy.
Um, <laughs> No, no, no. The, the graphic might have just incorrectly displayed it, but Force and Boys end up taking the victory here. Well done. And uh, that wraps up our first match of the day. We have two. Uh, we have Tempo Storm versus Archon coming up next. But before we go, we also want to thank RDU for stopping by on the cast. Do you have any last words you want to say about that series? Uh, thank you for having me here. It was a really insane series, really close. And uh, it feels bad to play Conquest in this kind of way, because you don't really want to lose for your team. It's so, so painful. I feel for Trump now. No we worries. Well, bit. you can go ahead and send your, your Skype messages to him. <laughs> or, you can, yeah. uh, or you can hashtag ATLC on Twitter mm -hmm. and let us know what you guys think about it and send your messages of condolences to Team Value Town or congratulations to Force and Boys as they were able to weather the early storm and finish out strong, being able to take the series six to five. What we're going to do is we're going to take a break, and when we come back, we're going to have a new guest caster, Strifeco, hop on with me and Crip, as well as Archonverse Tempo Storm, which should be a good one. I'm excited. Stay tuned, guys. <laughs>